everyone and welcome to uh, the January 9th meeting of the Planning Board of Northampton. Um, I don't know if we heard from any members. What's that? Um, I assume Sam is coming and I didn't hear from Krista. I know Jana is not coming. So it's a little bit after seven, we apologize, but we'd like to open up a special permit hearing with site plan, residential cluster open space for flag lot, sear driveway, and site improvements. Um, the applicant is the city of Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability, and the site's at 254 Old Wilson Road, Florence, map ID 4414. Does the applicant want to make a presentation? Sir. Sure. Uh, Wayne Biden, City of Northampton Planning Office. So this is a joint project between the city and the property owner. So I'm going to start and sort of give you big picture, and then uh, Chris Chamberlain is good from Berkshire Design is going to present the, the details of the project. So um, this is the old Pine Grove golf course, um, and the city has reached an agreement to purchase about 105 acres of the golf course. Um, and so the plan is the property owner is going to carve off five lots, which includes the existing home. Uh, and he's going to retain those, and we're going to buy the remaining land. Um, we do this deal, if you, if you remember, that the city's goal is to make sure that we're creating some building lots so our acquisition of open space isn't a limiting opportunity for people building their camp. So we I mean, it, it both made the deal work financially, frankly, but it also is important to us that we're getting building lots that are at. Um, and this year would be two sort of medium market lots, the, the, the one with the house on Pine Grove and the one behind the house, and three high-end lots that are further back. In the so that's, sort of, that, that's what we're trying to do. Um, on this sketch before you, you're going to see the black line, so the, the solid red, or the dark red, whatever I call it is, that's the land which we're in the process of purchasing. So we're going to talk about that in more detail. But just to give you a series of context, all the, that black outline to the north of that, that's the existing uh, Rocky Hill Greenway. So we went from having no conservation land about 10 years ago to we've been slowly building up through a series of acquisitions about 110 <coughs> acres of land. Um, and so that land goes all the way from the New Haven and Northampton Canal bike path up to Route 66, opposite the jail, actually crosses Route 66 to the ice pond and it extends all the way down to this property. It's important to us also I can get economic development. So when we purchase that open space, we carved out a seven acre parcel on Route 10, and we currently have a request for proposals on the street, and the city's hoping to sell that property for some kind of economic investment. So we're trying to get open space and economic development, but, but rationalize what it is. Um, the area in red when the golf course came on is really exciting to us because we'd like to restore this area. It's not going to be a golf course anymore from the city standpoint. There's a stream that goes through here. Um, the acquisition is being funded with a combination of city funds and uh, state funds. And the state was really interested because it's a resiliency project from their standpoint. We're restoring the golf course. It's going to be able to store more stormwater than it can store currently. Um, this may be a little deeper in the weeds than you need to know, but we get, here is a proposal for a cluster tonight. Two flag lots and three cluster lots. As part of a cluster, the property owner has to put a conservation restriction on a portion of, on some land to preserve his open space. So our offer for the property reflects a lower price than it would be because he's preserving some land. So if we're buying 105 acres, but we're basically paying for 95 acres, and there's 10 acres that in essence is being donated in order to allow the cluster to happen. So even though I'm talking about buying the land, we're complying with the cluster section that requires some of the land to be protected as open space. Um, so I just want to walk you through sort of the big picture special permit criteria, and then I'll turn it over to Chris. So um, I just listed the special permit criteria. I didn't do site plan, there's a lot of overlap. But we think the special permit commitment. Oh, wait, excuse me. Yeah. How close does this come to the um, <clears throat> uh, the land that we permitted for the storage facility on Route 5 and Route 10? Very close. So that, see the little red dot? 
the yeah. red dot is that's where that storage facility would be. So their access, th this is Sunnyside daycare right here. That property permit is right here. The additional parcel the city has on the market is right here. So that's, that's the land we carved out. If you remember in your legislative hat, you recommended not that many years ago that we rezone this property first from um, business park to general industrial and then general industrial to office industrial. And that was all part of saying, hey, the original vision is let's do more development. It never really worked. It was too steep, too wet, too much vernal pools, but we want to keep that, that important piece there. So that land will be developed and it's going to threaten that. Um, there's a stream, you can't really see it at the scale, but if you follow the red dot, I'm more or less following the stream. Um, and that's the really ecologically important piece. So we want to preserve the stream, we want to preserve the watershed to that stream. That stream crosses Route 10 now and actually threatens the culvert. Um, there's a lot of water goes through, it's very flashy. Um, it may wash out the culvert at some point. And then it goes down to Mass Audubon, and Mass Audubon's had a lot of erosion and sedimentation on their property. So one of the property gives us a chance to is hold some of the water back here. So right off the bat, the very first thing we're going to do is a small pond, man-made pond. We're going to lower the water level in the pond, but leave the dam in place. So in a heavy rainstorm, the water will come and it will fill the pond and it will release the water slowly. So we, you know, we basically have an attention pond that's already made for us thanks to the work that that field did in previous years. Um, and then over time, you know, our, we will be there are a series of catch basins and manifolds in the property. So water rains down, hits the golf course, often runs across the golf course, sometimes seeks into the sinks into the ground. But then there's a series of under drains. We'll be taking out the catch base. So this is going to make perfect sense for a golf course, but from a a resiliency standpoint, we want to store water longer. It doesn't make sense. So we will be spending about $200,000 in the next six months taking out all the cash basins, taking out all the manholes, um, and store and getting water to stay on the site for, for longer. So that's, that's the reason it's a, a good resiliency area is we'll be planting a lot of trees, we'll be taking out the cash basins, um, and so we'll be storing water for a lot longer. So is the idea to, with the golf course, to remove the structures and then let nature take over and it'll eventually be forest? Um, so a combination of things. We're going to remove immediately, it's a part of the project, is a, um, is that a pump house, the wood structure just below the dam? Is that what you used to for? Cement. Okay, so there's a structure just below the dam. We're gonna remove that structure. We're going to remove the catch basin. So we're doing some work. We are already planting trees. Um, if you remember when you permitted the um, Con Ed um, uh, solar units, they had to pay some tree mitigation money for cutting down trees. We're going to use some of that money to replant trees on this property. Um, so a combination of replanting some trees, doing some restoration, and yes, trees are going to replant. Um, we got a state grant to do a what's called a forest stewardship plan. We hired Mike Morey, and he's looking at what are the areas it's likely the trees will reseed itself? What are the things that we can do to encourage that? So the accommodation of things. So the golf course is a hundred and some acres, but that, but it primarily nature will just eventually make it forest. Right? Yes, that's what, the idea. Yes, the exact idea. The problem we have is, you know, mature forests in Massachusetts are mostly pretty healthy. We don't happen to have a lot of problem with invasive plants, but edges. Are, we have a major problem. You know, you know, you've all seen bittersweet. Bittersweet will take over and, you know, kill any forest trying to emerge. So we have to help it. It's frankly not the same thing. 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, it would have restored itself faster. Um, so we need to do little things, particularly about bittersweet and some other things as well. Um, the 18 putting greens, for example, the sod is so dense there that we have to basically scarify it to break it up to get trees to go through. So, but yes, I mean, certainly the rear of the golf course, you see in this picture, it's more heavily wooded back here. This area is going to more naturally reseed and replant itself. The larger expanses over here, less so. And then we are looking at, you know, can we do some sort of small agriculture here 
you know, five acre field that yet to be determined, you know. So, uh, so yes, it's gonna, it'll be some combination of things. And we are going to be doing a master plan. So part of it is I can't, and we know the first step is short of $50,000 of restoration that we're doing in the spring. Um, but we don't know a long-term, you know, 20 year plan because we haven't done the master plan yet. So we'll be doing the master plan this, this uh, spring as well. Um, you know, one of the things I'm going to talk about in a second is how this meets the city's comprehensive plans and, and other plans. One of the city's goals right now is for us to be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, but frankly, it's impossible for us to reduce a use of all cart. Right? People are, you know, people are still going to drive the interstate. People are still going to buy packages from Amazon. So we're looking at what are the ways that we can offset that. So planting trees here, getting the trees to grow, is going to sequester a lot of carbon. So we're going to reduce the city's energy footprint, but we're also going to be planting more trees and store, storing more carbon in trees and more carbon in the wetlands and more carbon <laughs> in the soils than the act that we were in the United States. So this cycle is all those things for us, which frankly is why the state has been so generous with grants, because they're really excited about this project. Um, and, you know, not, I think the other thing for the state is golf courses are closing in many places in the Commonwealth. And so I think they're actually interested in this because they're looking at, you know, what happens when golf courses close. Some will, I mean, some are going to stay open, but some are going to close. And so they're, even in Western Mass, there's four within 10 miles of Northampton, I think that's the number, that are in very processes of closing. So what, you know, how do we treat these? That's one reason the state is so interested in the process. Um, so, I won't go over all the special permit criteria here because I'm, what I'm going to say is basically the same for all these things. They are all about impacts on city services, impacts on traffic, impacts in the area, and obviously doing five building lots in an area that by right would have allowed a lot more building rights, you know, homes, is going to have far less impact than use. The uses could happen by right. You know, someone could do a series of homes right along the road and have not get any permits from you. So we have less impact than that. We're going to be building a trail for the property. You know, Gill's property has these wonderful walking trails already that the golfers use. We're going to retain most of those, uh, and we're going to link them all the way up to the bike path. So we're going to be promoting people walking, giving people options out there. Um, so <coughs> we're going to have less impact on any development which will occur. We're going to mitigate, you know, reduce stormwater runoff, save the culvert on Route 10. Um, and, and do all those things. I won't go through all this, but most of the things fit in that category. We're going to have far less impact on those things, and we think actually have a net positive impact. The special regulations, Chris Chamberlain will go over this in more detail, but you know, the main special regulations are one of the requirements for open space residential. I've already talked to the open space, but they end up there selling at bargain price meets the open space requirements, and, and Chris will walk through the other things. Um, and then finally, the open space plan, you know, that this. This project is consistent with the Climate Resiliency Regeneration Plan that hasn't been adopted yet, but it's an advanced draft. The Open Space Plan is sustainable on campus, all of which are about creating more open space, um, sequestering more carbon, but not preventing new developments. So this, because this property is currently in Chapter 61B, which is the current taxation program, the city taxes will actually go up dramatically. So our revenue will go up a lot because we get almost no taxes right now from the golf course. We get taxes from the clubhouse itself and from the one home, but not from that golf course itself because the taxes on 61B land are incredibly low. Um, so that will go up. And one of the benefits of three high end homes is the reality is we make money in high end homes. The, the school kids tend to not get across the state. Is this going to be, when this is done, is this going to be considered a park? I mean, if I wanted to take my kid there and I wanted to GPS how to get there, how would, is, is that part of this plan? Like, yes. So we, we call it a greenway. It's not going to be playgrounds. It's not going to be that kind of thing. But it's like if you've been to Fitzgerald Lake or yeah. you've been to something like that. There will be trails. We, you said GPS on that we, you know, we, we work with people who want to do geocaches, mm -hmm. recreation department is open to putting exercise trails along it. So the term the state uses is passive recreation. So this passive recreation will have an address that you yes. can use. And it'll be on our maps and yep. all those people can, then there'll be a sign along the road. So I'm going to turn over to Chris, unless there's five questions for me. 
Okay. Uh, again, Chris Chamberlain, I'm a professional engineer with Friction Design Group here in Northampton. Um, and our task on this, well, I'm very excited about um, everything that Wayne just talked about, was more focused on the housing development um, piece of this and, uh, and uh, pre preparing the site plan um, for the five lots that we're building. Um, so this is now a slightly larger scale um, view of the golf course property. Um, again, the course essentially fills uh, the vast majority of this lot, um, but the existing development uh, is clustered around this western edge. Um, we have an, uh, with the existing single family home, which is a frontage lot on Old Wilson Road. Uh, and then there's an access driveway into the clubhouse area. Uh, 150 car parking lots here that services the clubhouse which is located roughly here and then that drive continues to a storage area located here and then there's an existing cell tower uh, where this red dot is uh, in this <clears throat> location um, and so with that orientation um, this is now zoomed in on that area of development and one of the things that is uh, a nice synergy between what Wayne wants to do with this property and what uh, we can develop is that uh, we focus the development of the houses on that area that already has most of the development of the property, which also is the furthest distant from the existing portions of the greenway. So the connectivity between the conservation land and the existing greenway is very good. Um, and then for the most part, the sandbox that we're playing in is already disturbed. And so there are three types of lots here, again, five overall. Um, there is uh, the flag lot, which is here, which on its own uh, requires a special permit. Um, and we comply with uh, all of the zoning criteria for the flag lot, a maximum 300 foot uh, flag pole, which is uh, minimum 50 feet wide. Um, and then uh, the development circle that's required is shown here. Um, we have the frontage lot, which has the uh, existing single family house on it. Um, and then the cluster is three housing lots, one, two, and three that are all serviced by a single common driveway uh, coming off of Old Wilson Road. Um, and then on the next sheet, we see the proposed plan, which again on that flag lot uh, shows, oops, my pointer, shows the uh, access drive in uh, to the proposed uh, building location. Um, the uh, existing frontage lot essentially remains unchanged. Um, and then we take advantage of the existing access drive into the clubhouse. We're gonna retain that as the first length of the common drive, which then turns and services the, the three housing lots. Um, the existing pavement's in good shape, so we're gonna retain that. And then we're retaining the existing grade um, and then paving over the existing gravel surface as we uh, reach these upper lots here. And then also respecting uh, the existing cell phone lot uh, area. Um, and uh, so the cluster development, um, again, meets uh, the zoning requirements uh, for frontage uh, as well as the requirements of the driveway, with one exception that we are asking for a waiver on. Um, the common driveway requirements have a maximum of 10% slope. Um, we would like to take advantage of the existing access drive and not create the disturbance that would be required to flatten it out, but it does, uh, in a short section right here, uh, where my pointer is, uh, it's 10 to, 15, uh, 10 to 13%. Uh, for a short distance of only uh, 100, 150 feet. Um, again, we'd like to retain that grade so that we don't have to grade out and disturb and cut existing trees, um, anything else like that. Um, so another advantage of that is that to create these five housing lots, we only need to create one new curb cut, which is for the flag lot. Uh, <clears throat> the existing single family house retains its existing driveway. And again, we're using that um, existing access road into the clubhouse. Um, and um, and then uh, I'd also add that because uh, this project is proposing to disturb more than an acre of land, we were required to get a stormwater permit. 
uh, that was granted today with a couple of minor conditions asking for a little bit more detail on some of the drainage structures that are to be removed, um, as well as some detail on uh, dry wells that we're proposing. Um, in general, within this development pocket, setting aside everything else on the golf course, just in this housing development pocket, we're reducing impervious coverage slightly. We're also <coughs> adding some level of stormwater control to uh, primarily for safe conveyance of the water, but also some dry wells to promote groundwater infiltration and also looking at water quality. Um, so overall, we feel like uh, the stormwater up this piece of the site will be greatly improved. Um, and then we also uh, received comments from DPW today, uh, which also had a couple of uh, requests for minor additions for more detail. Um, and then also uh, recorded uh, for posterity that it pointed out that this lot here is close to the maximum elevation that the city water uh, service can provide. The maximum elevation that the water can service is 320. Portions of this lot are above that. Um, and so the intention is to site the house so that the plumbing fixtures can be installed uh, on city pressure. Uh, the comments note that if we can't do that, then a tank and pump may be required. Um, but there is slope on this property. It slopes from high to low. There, there are portions of it that are well below that 320, so we don't anticipate a problem there. Um, and so, you know, I, I to close before taking any questions. That you know, we're we're very pleased that that this project is going to add significant protected uh, open space while also uh, increasing the number of, of homes that, that can be built in Northampton. Um, on the traffic question, uh, certainly the, the conversion of the golf course to five single family homes is gonna be a reduction uh, in traffic out of this site. Uh, we're happy with the sight lines um, on those uh, driveways that are entering Old Wilson Road. Um, and then it's also uh, exciting that, that uh, this new development will be connected through the Greenway to some of the alternative modes of transportation. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have on this piece of the project. Board members. So Chris, I'll ask, we didn't really sure. have a, a utilities plan for this. Any details? Could you talk a little bit about the delivery of utilities to the- Absolutely. Uh, lots? Um, so it would be on city water, which is available in Old Woodson Road. As I mentioned, there's a potential for an, an elevation uh, restriction on that, um, but uh, the flag lot would be serviced by a single uh, water connection and then uh, the three cluster lots, we'd make one tap in the main um, and then bring that to a split uh, with three valves to service each of the three homes, uh, which is typically what we do in these, in these clusters. The, the water main is happier if we only puncture it once. Uh, this area is on septic. We've done perk tests in each of the lots and found those acceptable um, for the design of septic system. Uh, there's plenty of space on them to site those uh, and also provide enough offset from those stormwater features that we're going to have. The plan refers to um, dry wells? Yes. What, what's that for? Uh, that is for stormwater control. Um, the soils are not ideal. They're not terrible, but they're not ideal. And so um, sort of a, a larger formal means of trying to infiltrate stormwater into the ground is not especially feasible, especially with the slopes. Um, so in lieu of that, essentially each of the houses gets connected to a, a structure in the ground in crushed stone. Um, those will fill up, overflow probably in a really intense storm, but then that water can dissipate into the ground over time to reduce the volume um, of water coming off the site in addition to the maximum flow rate. As far as the uh, electrical provisions? Um, so those uh, would be trenched in underground from the streets uh, along, the common, uh, along the driveways. So Carolyn, normally there's a, a call out seat for utilities that are kind of approved, right, for a, a development like this. So without that, they present something that they presented something to DPW in more detail. Well, there are the water lines are shown. On, uh, I thought they were. I didn't. I didn't want to disagree with that. Oh, okay. Uh, I oh. Think and the, the sheets I, at the end were the were the engineering drawings. I think they're not drawings. on every plan, but there is one plan sheet that shows the water lines. Did you see it? Uh, no, nothing. No. Sorry. I didn't. I, it's interesting you asked because <coughs> I had the same conversation with 
David Valletta, I think, at DPW. And it, I think maybe an earlier version didn't have the water lines, but I. I, I think, unfortunately, there was a little um, miss in which sheets went to yeah. which people. Uh, okay. There are not different drawings around, but there are drawings that are showing different pieces yeah. of the project. And I think it's possible that our initial <laughs> submission didn't include all of them, which I apologize for. Okay. Very good. Well, as long as somebody in this city um, has I, something that will. One thing I can say for certain is that EPW has uh, reviewed the, the utility connection, and they certainly would have let us know in the comments yep. uh, if they had not. Okay. Yep. Great. This might be a question for Carolyn, but can you just explain the thing for 125 feet? Because I looked at the zoning diagram and it was totally unclear what that 125 feet is dimensioning. So the 125 feet in, in lot down, are you talking about the, the five lot? The change that you asked them to make in the lot, the sure. five lot, the 125 so, is yeah. so ambiguous. You're, so the standard frontage in um, the suburban residential district uh, is a requirement that you have 125 feet of lot width all the way back to the rear of a structure. Um, for flag lots, you're, um, you can come to the Planning Board for a special permit to reduce that 125 feet. Um, but, um, and it can go down to as narrow as 50 feet. And that's what we call the flag pole. And then the flag portion of that lot is where it opens up to a much bigger piece. So um, the restrict, the requirement is that um, you can have that narrower frontage. So in this case, down to 50 feet for a total length of 300. At that point, the lot needs to be wide enough and it, she's um, uh, talking about that tree yeah the, the lot needs thing. to be wide enough to meet the 125 foot immediately at, after 300 at, right that was the part that it was yeah and beyond that it can of course be wider but it yeah. can't narrow down <coughs> again until beyond where the structure is located <laughs> so uh Chris, you mentioned about the waiver for the 10% slope. Yes. And I think there's another waiver about some of the details around the shared driveway. Oh, yes. Um, and so the uh, purpose of that is that the, the shared driveway requires turnouts um, where the driveway widens every so often. Uh, what our intention is, uh, the, the minimum requirement uh, in this scheme is a 15 foot wide driveway. The existing driveway is of 20 to 24 feet wide. It varies in some locations. We would like to retain that. The pavement's in good shape. We don't we don't see a reason to, to disturb all of that. Um, and so it might be interpreted that we're not providing those turnouts because the driveway is wider. Uh, however, it is also wide enough to act as the turnout. So uh, we just wanted to highlight that sort of ambiguity and ensure that the, the board uh, is satisfied with the driveway that we're providing. Um, yeah, and I would say it's not a waiver because what the shared driveway standard says is minimally you can go down to X, you know, 15 feet. But if you're going to be that narrow for a shared driveway, you have to widen out <coughs> Um, distances. So if you're already that wide, you're not going to right. the minimum. Right. That's the interpretation I was leaning for, but we wanted to cover our bases and, and make sure that it was clear what we were um, proposing to do and that everyone was comfortable. With that wide driveway, does that hold true between where that 10% slope is and, and lots three and four? Because that's going to be a new driveway, right? Um, <clears throat> that's up to the cell tower. Well, maybe not to right. the cell tower. Right. I mean, there's, there's existing that really there's existing access all the way up to this point. Yep. This last driveway, which is now not a common driveway because it's it's uh, okay. leading to the single house, that would be narrower, but uh, seeing that it's serving a single house, there's no reason for that to be here. Thanks. So the existing house, which has kind of been the, the maintenance yard for the golf course, that in turn is gonna be um, retained by the owner and used. Do we have any plans around the investigation of that area due to perhaps any use of pesticides in the past or is that something under our purview or the applicant's purview to look at that? So we tested the property which we're purchasing and there was no report of conditions, no concerns. We didn't test the property, which we're not purchasing. 
and it's not required. I mean, you know, buyer may or may not choose okay. to do that, but All right. it's neither a permit requirement for you or a DEP requirement. Banks will often require it, so practically may have. <coughs> and as long as the board understands, once we approve these lots, the the builder, the app, the other app, the owner doesn't need to come before us again for any kind of review of the the. The building operation, the building process, other than working with the city's building inspector. Right. Right. So. <clears throat> well, if we want to hold questions for a little bit, then we'll open it up to the public. See if there's. Okay. Is there anyone in the uh, public who would like to come forward and speak on this application, please? And if you just state your name and where you live, that would be great for our records. Um. So my name is Deborah Hopkins, and my family lives at 50 Old Wilson Road. I live at uh, 21 Grove Ann Street in East Ham. Um, so one of my questions was, um, I know where the house is, I know where the stream is from the road. Where exactly is the stream? to the flag line, and what is the flag line? Is that where there'll be other houses, or? So if I understand that there are two flag lots here, you know, with the existing little clubhouse, the, not the clubhouse, but the maintenance set is on Old Wilson Road where all the equipment is kept, just to the, I want to say the east of there, if you're looking at that building to the left will be the entrance, the driveway to the first flag lot. So that would so be- So it's on the other side right of, of that. So if you're going up Wilson Road, yeah. the house is on the right. Yeah, and okay, that would be so just be past after. it, correct. So that's the, the, back. the drive to the flag lot. So where the stream is, is there any building no, not at all. That's the area that we really, the applicant really wants to protect, the city will. That stream that comes under Old Wilson Road and goes across. It comes out, it goes the through. So there's yeah. no building or flag lots on that side. So everything is from the stream right. over. Yep. Oh, okay. And a flag lot is where they can build at some point? Or? Right. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to? Yeah, so a flag lot is, is a lot for a single family house. Um, so there's one flag lot proposed to, as um, um, Mr. Kohout um, stated, to, on the left side of the existing house. But it's the, the access to it is there, but the house is actually located behind where the existing house is. Then there are three other lots proposed to be off of that driveway that goes up to the cell tower that will be around and up on the hill. And that's the extent. So there'll be five single family house lots at the end. Of oh, that. so that's the five the total. Yep. Okay. And as far as the paths and the greenway, our property is, so if you're going up Wilson Road and everything's on your right, our property is the angle that goes right up to the top of the hill. Okay. Um, how do you prevent people from, I, I mean, is it all sign posted for path or are people going to be kind of coming over to our property through and down and coming out of our backyard? Sure. Because that's all it's Sure. Uh, Mr. Biden, maybe you want to talk how the city yeah, creates those boundaries? We put a sign up at the main entrance to the property. So we, you know, we figure, we haven't done this yet, we put right. a spot where it's safe for people to park along the edge of the road. Okay. Um, we have looked at it. We only build parking lots when we need to. We don't think we need to. We think Old Wilson Road's wide enough for a couple of cars to park there. Yeah. So, you know, we look at one of the existing trails that Gil built through the property as sort of best walkway in and put, you know, a sign there to welcome and put a couple of So it's all gonna be noted. Okay. Yeah. And people, People can wander anywhere they want, right? But we're right. sort of invite them down the trail. Yes. Oh, all right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, anyone else would like to speak regarding the application? Okay. Any other questions from board members? 
I think it's a very good project and it should go forward. Accomplishes a number of different objectives as Wayne explained. I'm somewhat interested about the cell phone tower and on lot three. I imagine that may be the last <coughs> lot four. Um, no, it's actually on lot three. Lot four is beyond the cell phone tower, right? Is the, I'm reading this correctly. Yeah. yeah. But I guess the applicant feels that that lot would be um, <coughs> that's a good cell phone service. Good <laughs> yeah. cell phone service, yeah. It's a huge structure. Um, and I know the applicant said, you know, there are no health concerns around EMS or anything. It's just very unusual that that would be in somebody's backyard. But I guess they'll make up for it with the view towards Mount Tom. They won't be looking out their back door, they'll be looking out their front door. <laughs> And a 200 acre backyard is not too bad either. Right. Yeah. Are they going to put, I mean, I was just talking to someone who built these, builds these things for a living. Is there going to be an aesthetic component to the cell phone? No. It's already there. It's, there. it's already there. Yeah. Huh. yeah. You buy, buy or no is going in. Oh, well, great. <laughs> it's kind of pretty hard to avoid. Yeah. Put, put on some, some nice. I think it's surrounded by some pretty mature trees, though. I don't think you, I mean, we have to see it as part of CBC. And I don't any well, because the hill is steep, you get some. I mean, if you design the house right, you could hide the house. You're right, you face it in one direction, the hillside is protected. They're going to be looking at their phones anyway, so. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have cell phones. <laughs> Um, so GPW yeah, just had a few so. comments, um, and they just want to see final construction plans prior to um, 15 days prior to the issuance of any building permits. Um, they did ask about uh, questions about potential removal of um, pipes that are on <clears throat> the city property, but I don't think you necessarily need to put that in any conditions. It's not related to their stormwater permit, and it may not happen. It just depends on whether they find that there are structures that are found on, on the property. Um, there, the requirement in the zoning does um, require that the um, applicant submit um, and sit, submit easements for maintenance and access for the shared driveway and that those be reviewed prior to issuance of the building permit and then they need to go on record um, as well. Uh, there weren't any plans uh, related to EV um, construction, photovoltaics on the property. So I think that should be a condition of the permit that when before the issuance of the building permit for those lots, they have to show how they're meeting that standard in the zoning. I'm um, sorry, Carolyn, tell me once more again about that standard. So the site plan review, um, the site plan um, section requires that all, lot, all buildings be solar ready, essentially. So um, they would need to show on the building permit, so the end user, so the builder for each individual house would have to show that either the roof is um, oriented in the right direction and is structurally sound or that there's a place on the site for ground mount to They don't have to install it, they just have to show that it's ready for um, someone to install it. Um, there's also tree protection shown on the property, so that um, tree protection should be installed and inspected prior to a building permit. Um, and that open space is, typic is typically required to be um, permanently protected prior to issuance of building permits for any of the construction. So that would have to be deeded over to the city. Um, and there's also tree replacement that um, is shown in the plan. So um, that should all happen. Uh, compliance with that section 12.3 should take place prior to issuance of a certificate. Sure, I have one more question. This, has anyone, has the fire department looked at this? With the access, especially the last lot? Yeah, so the, um, so I, the, I reached out to the fire chief about the, um, the grades. So that's an issue. They're asking for a waiver of the grades. Um, the fire department, um, um, 
requested a permit condition that uh, sprinklers be installed in those last two house okay. lots to offset the fact that the grades are steeper than what's allowed in the plans. And it's really about fire apparatus, not emer other emergency services. I think you need the 20 feet wide also with the fire code now for the driveway for that last one. I'm not sure. I mean, um, that's not what the fire, fire chief yeah. mentioned. He, he was just more yeah, concerned. Yeah, it's more of a commercial. I, but I, I'm. I don't well, know the fire code as it's well. It's pretty strange, but the um yeah, but and, and we just request that that condition be written as an either or of of complying with the sprinkler requirement or um, regrading the roads. Uh, obviously, if that changes the limit of disturbance, that that would trigger resubmissions. But um, right, I think the, the condition would be attached attached to sort of any portion of the. Um, however. So, it's any portion of the driveway that is steeper than the grades that are the maximum grades allowed in the zoning. However, if there's a change to the plan, so the drive, so um, the grades are changed that triggers the uh, amount of grading and tree clearing, that would require a plan amendment. Right. So that I think the the way the plans are shown now, you're asking not to make any changes. So I think the condition for the sprinklers should go in. If they change and they don't want to do the sprinklers, then they'd have to come back anyway to show you the regrading plan to meet that um, maximum. Is that pressure issue an issue with sprinklers on the last lot? Uh, it's a cost. They, yeah, there's, there's, there's a cost. You need, there a need to be a pump. Yeah, an emergency generator. Wait, wait. Okay. Yeah, rain. Plenty of tax money. But. <laughs> wait, but that has been a condition with other development further out in the city where there isn't city water too that they've had to have cisterns in their basement mm -hmm. that was allowable for and build a sprinkler system so for big houses for big houses mm -hmm. far from them yeah uh yep the public hearing is open please state your name and address <laughs> and you. edward Eftridge of northampton 64 rapid street i represent gilbert Rowe, the, the owner of the development <coughs> um what uh, chris uh, just said is that if you even phrase it, I, I understand what Carol is saying, is we come back for a plan amendment. But if it were phrased in the condition that the alternate, unless you come back for a plan amendment, it might be administrative, which would save us having to have the whole hearing process again. So if you, you, if, if, uh, you use that language in your decision, it might make it easier administratively to make that decision. I would recommend, I, I don't think it's hard to know what the extent of grading would be to get those grades down or the change in the direction. Of, so um, I would be hesitant to um, recommend that it just be an administrative decision. It's just hard to know without knowing what the extent of the change would well, be. Well, yeah, I'm not, yes, it would come back to planning to make that decision. I don't have a problem with that, but as to requiring a full hearing for an amendment. I guess, can, is it acceptable if we phrase it, uh, any houses located beyond any portion of the driveway steeper than, than what's required in zoning? Well, you, she only referred to the last two, so yeah. I think that probably. Well, that, that's, uh, that's the extent of the condition. That yeah. doesn't have any relationship, though, to changes to the plan right. that make right. the driveway right. Right. less steep. So that's yeah. the issue. It's not, it, there's absolutely no problem right. with saying, condition um, is associated with all the house lots that right. are above a certain um, driveway grade yeah it's just I, I guess we're just uh, if there is a future where a plan is <coughs> amended uh, administratively but the condition were written such that there was an obligation to have sprinklers in those last two houses regardless that is we're trying to just prevent that from I don't think, that's, I think that you, you can get out of the sprinkler requirement if you regrade the exactly. road. Yeah. Exactly. But I think the, the variety of options of what that looks like if you redesign that road are so wide that we're not comfortable saying that's going to be a good decision. Because you could have to chop down an acre of trees to make that work. I mean, right. who knows? Right. Okay. I was just it may be simple. Place. Hopefully it's simple. Yeah. Right. If I could just I mean, add, add, not complicated, but you often list the conditions for special permit site plan in one list. Just to be clear, this is a site plan condition and not a special permit condition. So if they came back, they wouldn't have to open up the special permit. I would hope you'd that. Okay. Um, I'm 
my understanding as a, a construction project like this unfolds, it's uh, somewhat of a development, and that usually the roads and utilities are placed first before, and then there's some kind of a, um, approval by the DPW or the city regarding the extent of the road, or is that only for public right in the way? So what I'm, I'm saying is that, does that slope need to be kind of set already before any building happens as far as the homes go? Existing. No, but it's not ex the, the, it's not existing all the way. Um, and it's just a driveway, so no, they're doing, yeah. it's really it's the standard in the way. zoning for the driveway is what is what um, um, is required to be met. So. So it sounds like we're we're asking we're being asked to approve just one waiver. Actually, the applicant has asked for two, but Carolyn, you've kind of hedged on one of them. Is our is our approval going to list two waivers that we're approving? Well, I would. I mean, I think that this the second one. The, there's no waiver related mm -hmm. to the width of the driveway because they're meeting the standard of having a wide enough area to pass. So it's just an administrator. So I would just say it's me. <clears throat> There's um, there is a the, the there's a continuous passing lane okay. basically it's a it's a two way okay. driveway. So we're just getting asked at this point for the one way for the the one way. Right. Appropriate to close the public hearing. I'd like to just go through the conditions one time that we're talking about so that we make sure that if those are pretty clear to all of us and to while we have our experts out there in our audience. So if I heard correctly. Um, the conditions are regarding uh, final construction plans being provided to the planning office and the DPW. Right, 15 um, days ahead of yep. uh, the um, uh, A requirement for the applicant to note that um, the building, uh, something about the photovoltaic preparation. Right, prior to building <clears throat> permit, the um, plans need to show that uh, the buildings are solar ready. Okay. And that the plans need to show the adequate tree protection, and the tree protection has to be in place before any construction happens. Yeah. Um, prior to any building permits, there has to be a recorded deed at the with by the city and the applicant regarding the conservation restriction. Uh, transfer of the land to the city. There is the condition regarding the provision of a sprinkler system for lots three and four. And for, for those lots that are um, on the portions of the driveway that exceed 10%. So not just calling out three and four. And there was one, Carolyn, I didn't get entirely about compliance with C3. Compliance with was that back for the photovoltaic preparation? Uh, was that uh, uh, in relation to the, the deed of hmm. conservation? Um, that so might have been the um, conservation area um, um, deeding that. Um, there was the only other one that I have is related to um, um, tree replacement. Uh -huh. Point three. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's a, this is the condition, but I just noticed the zoning table. I think the numbers were not right. <clears throat> not black line. Okay. Maybe you use another version, but the, the one that you sent around, okay. the two page one. So, um, the flat was the wrong side. I didn't check all of them for that. Right. So, they re they they revised plan set. So, the plan set on the screen is what's been submitted to the city now to show compliance with the flat line. That's different from what you emailed around. It's um, different. One with the yeah. square off. Yeah, it should the zoning table shows a different. Oh, it does? Maybe the table doesn't match the lot layout. Is that what you're saying? That's what I was, I, that's my suspicion. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing is, as part of the conditions that um, final construction plans have to be submitted, um, you know, making sure that the um, zoning table is um, um, consistent with the plan show. Actually, it was lot two that was the issue that I checked. I didn't check them all. Thank you for checking that one. So, any other questions about the conditions or to the applicant before we 
motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor of closing the public hearing? Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. So if there are no more questions, is someone brave enough to make a motion on this okay. application with the conditions we've listed? <coughs> Motion to approve the special permit to the site plan residential cluster open space, flag lot, shared yard way, and site improvements. See the number 10 plan office of 20, and 254, Old Wilson Road, Florence, map ID for 4 4 with the motion condition. Second. Second. Any discussion? So I'll just second Alan's comment that it seems like a great plan and you know, I think the city's put together a great proposal along with the uh, previous <coughs> owner of the property. I think it's going to be a great win win for the city on extending this network. So, all right, all in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you.
just a few more minutes, folks. Central LA has been golf We're about to open up at 7 30 p.m. public hearing um, for a St. Elizabeth Dan Seaton Parasite Plan Amendment. 
the modified parking lot layout, 99 King Street, map ID 31B 159 plus 192. Chairman, before we go, could you remind us when the planning board the initial approval of this site plan was? Uh, I believe it's 2011. 12. Um, 12. 12. 11, it yeah. came in, approved in 12. So yeah, and, and that, the context of that site plan. Was so this the, this is yeah. what I'm showing you right now. This is what was originally approved. So I'm Terry Reynolds, professional engineer, and I'm here for St. Elizabeth Dan Seaton Parish. And uh, this is Sacred Heart Church on King Street. Uh, and in between 2011 and, and 2012, this overall plan was approved. Um, which consisted of uh, an additional building, a new uh, parish center um, here, uh, parking uh, both in the rear and on the side. And then additional improvements in front with a heart-shaped walkway and planting. Um, and so what ended up happening was this project got broken down into phases. Uh, and in the end, um, the only only the southern part of this project got built, um, and so currently, um, there you go. No, come back. Here we go. All right. So this is what's currently there. So there's a a stormwater system here that was designed for the overall site uh, and then a revised parking lot um, and that's what you see today um, otherwise uh, in the original there were some buildings that were torn down uh, that you don't see but there was a building right here that got left as a gravel parking lot um, which was never approved and so part of this effort is to take care of that gravel parking lot that's been a problem um, for for the city and, and just in general it's running into king street and center seven to the road um, so the other thing is is this parking lot that they have right now is not adequate for their parking needs so they've been using that gravel area as overflow parking um, so uh, what has been proposed is to move forward with sort of a, a phase two, which um, doesn't build the building, the new building over there, they cannot afford it at the moment, um, but does take care of this gravel parking lot. And in doing so, uh, you would partially be creating uh, a new parking area on the north side of the building. Um, that basically it's it's a little different configuration than what was there originally uh, but overall it is a, a reduction of basically nine parking spaces from the overall design that was previously approved um, it is also a net reduction in the pervious area so that the original stormwater system will still function as as originally approved uh, it's still going to be over designed because it's designed for the entire parking expansion plus uh, the building that was originally proposed that is not currently being built. Uh, so uh, this plan is our layout and planting plan. So um, basically the zoning has changed. So at this point, street trees are required. So street trees are, are proposed along it, along with other uh, landscaping trees around uh, the parking lot and <coughs> front, providing a little bit of buffering from the parking lot um, and then building out that front walkway, the heart shaped walkway on the front of the site. Um, some of the comment, one of the comments that came back was in regard to there are some conflicts with some of these proposed trees. Um, I think the two, there are two trees um, right here and here. Uh, that are going to conflict with some of the uh, utility structures. Uh, so those will probably need to be changed to shrubs and, and perennials. Can you just point those out again? Sorry. Uh, they're, they're right here. And there's one there and one here. Uh, this one down here also is, 
is too close to where the sewer connection is, so that will need to be moved. Uh, that, that one will be kept because it's required for the street trees, but it just needs to be moved so it's not sitting on top of the sewer structure. Um, so, and I'm sorry, you stated that that this heart safe configuration we see on this plan is going to be accomplished, is going to be implemented? Yes, yes, and that's, that's exactly what was approved originally. Um, uh, with with some modification to the plantings, um, the, this this whole project is part of uh, uh, building improvements for the building. So the building is proposed to have the front step area rebuilt. The pillars are you know in the process of trying to get those re rehabbed, uh, refinished, and so on. Uh, a number of different. Uh, improvements in that regard. The handicap, the existing handicap ramp here on the south side uh, is dilapidated and that is going to be rebuilt. It's currently not really in compliance, so it's going to be extended uh, by about five feet to meet you know, handicap requirements for ramps. Um, so that is the only improvement um, on that side uh, in terms of structural improvements. There are some uh, reallocation of the handicap spaces up on that side. Uh, these two spaces where I'm showing right here are not compliant. Um, so those will be eliminated and replaced out where we have a walkway and a hatch area. Um, two additional spaces will be added over here where there's also a ramp um, uh, to provide the required uh, handicap parking spaces. Um, there is no general public access on the north side of the building, so that's why all the handicap spaces are on the south. So the plan that we have before us that shows one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight handicap spaces, that's their final resting spot, so to speak? Uh, there's six total in the end. Yeah. Two are eliminated. Because they don't meet they don't meet the slope requirements. And which two are they going to be? So those are these two right here. This is removed. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah so additionally, so in terms of this next plan, basically is showing the stormwater system, and this is basically what was originally proposed. Uh, there are no, you know, any any significant changes to it. Uh, it will be pretty significantly over designed at the moment. Uh, this is a new drywall system that was not constructed. This is sized large enough to accommodate the, the original proposed building, uh, but at this time it's only going to be taking the north side of the existing building uh, for for stormwater management there. Uh, otherwise, uh, there really are no new structures other than a sewer stub that is being run across the front of the building for a potential future building when and if uh, the uh, diocese can uh, afford to, to build it, if they can sell some of their other properties. Uh, and, uh, I think uh, that's pretty, pretty much it. There's not too much else. Uh, questions. Board members have any questions before we turn to the public? <clears throat> public comment. Okay. Anyone interested in commenting on the plan? <clears throat> to close public comment. Well, if we do that, then we can't ask the applicant any questions, oh, really. So we need to, I know you want to get through this, want to get back on time, but we're going to move. Um, so could you tell us any uh, comments from the DPW regarding the storm order? Yeah, so they received comments from the storm, uh, regarding stormwater, um, their stormwater plan. They have a separate stormwater department, so all of that is sort of separate from the planning board review. They, other comments related to, um, from the
from DPW is they just want to see final construction plans that correct some inconsistencies in the um, in the um, plans with um, the types of materials being used and some um, um, inverts and and um, test pit information. Um, they also um, are concerned about um, possibility of the proposed trees at the northeast corner of the main entrance that might conflict with the new sewer line proposed. So they want the plans to show the right, you know adjustment of the location, the planting of those trees, um, and. Um, that's basically it, except for some other details about just, again, creating, um, cleaning up the construction documents before they are submitted. Again, 15 days. Actually, this one says 30 days ahead of, so you guys can decide whether you think 15 days or 30 days. I think the DBW has gone both ways, and I, I mean, 15 days, two weeks is a good amount of time, so. Um, um, the other um, issues, um, not DPW related, but um, relate to the lighting on the site that don't um, um, appear not to meet um, or could potentially be an issue. Um, they're showing a 4,000 Kelvin um, light and you would typically yeah. require 3,000. Um, and also, I raised a concern in my staff memo to you all and I gave it to the applicant um, was that um, there, we've seen problems with these clutch um, LED lamps creating glare. Um, so, um, this is what I received for an updated fixture. Okay. Um, and these do come in at 3,000. Okay. But they can they use. So, so I understand that there was a lot of talk about public street lighting and public Twitter at different sites in Manhattan. 3,500 people like former lights. That's for public street lighting. Was there another? Is there another? There's nothing regular in this property, right? Um, so I'm not sure I know exactly what you're right. referring to, but yes, there's a sort of interest group and lights around. Right. Street. I'm not talking about that. That's I'm not talking about Well, I don't know, but there's the zoning <laughs> relates to lighting on private property. Our code actually, we can. Um, I have a draft of an updated lighting ordinance because it hasn't been updated for six or seven years and it doesn't include LED stand or lights. So um, based on information that the board has heard previously about the impacts of different lights um, and light color temperature and so forth, um, the board started requiring um, warmer lights at, and have a maximum of 3,000 <coughs> K instead of bluer lights um, or cooler lights. Um, beyond that, no, it's not in the zoning, but you have jurisdiction um, reviewing site plan to require a certain level. Um, the idea is in the updated, the draft uh, lighting amendment will address color temperature, will address LED lamps, how they should be shaded. Um, it's just that we haven't right. caught up to the newer technology. And the board often has a condition around how long the lights can stay on yep. in the evening sure. until operations are over or something like that. Right. Make sure that those are part of the thing. Did, uh, did you rerun the lighting analysis with a different light? No, you're fine, saying the fine one on is driving that, and I would say just condition it that they resubmit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the lighting design. Because I mean, if you go to a warmer light, you need more lumens. Yeah, so you have a brighter light. Well, I, it depends. I wouldn't necessarily say you need more. I think you can accomplish um, a light, you know, an even lighting. Um, you might need more, um, depending on how low the fixtures are, you might right. need more across the site. But the standard would still be the same. You can't exceed a certain um, maximum um, illumination level across the property. So that's not changing with any kind of right. conditions. It's just about the, um, and you don't necessarily need to see the revisions as long as you set the standard to say this is the maximum, 
you know, color temperature um, and also glare is a stand is already has been a standard um, or prevention of glare has been a standard for decades. But um, I think the issue has really been that um, the way the LED lights work is it, it's it, they're set differently than incandescent lights and so it creates a different um, glare. Um, it creates glare differently than incandescent light. <coughs> so that's that, which we haven't well, already yet. what was in the previous submission was showing like a 9,000 lumen picture and the zoning says you can't have more than 8,000. So if we're going to ask them to do a little warmer, they're going to have an even higher. They're already expecting the 10K, like the 10,000. So. Well, again, no, it's about the number of lights that you have and where they're placed, right? Well, it's all related. Uh, yeah. Trying to get a minimum light level for safety right. in the parking lot that you won't fall down on the ice and everything yeah. at night. So you can have cooler lights and you have less of them, you have more light. And then there's the temperature, which you're talking about, but there's also lighting levels. Yeah. But that's the glare, right? So, I mean, already they're, I don't, I don't care, man. It's fine, but like, if, I was just wondering, like, what, what's been done previously, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe we There's an 8,000 number in the zoning. Yeah, and that number actually, I think, is a, is, um, um, is not an act, it, it, it was a typo, I think, it's been in there for years, and we have to change that. Um, I think the number that you're referring to, but at any rate, I think the, it may be the case that they need to have more of these lights, mm -hmm. but they still can't, they still need to find the balance of how they're meeting all of those right. if you put these additional conditions on. So, and that's typically what the board's done. Okay. Yeah. So um, on, on the planning number, this is more a question about the previous work, I think, and just uh, something that I have on the drainage plan on seat five, on the south side of the parking lot, which really isn't under consideration, yeah. that depicts an underground kind of retention system. Yeah. Yeah. And were you part of that installation? I'm just interested. No, in there, there were issues with that. And that's yeah. part, that's why I was brought in to actually get them in compliance. Um, so at this point, I've been working with DPW, uh, fully inspected everything out there. We found some issues um that had to be changed um some of the there were issues with the overall grading of it initially um and so modifications had to be made um in terms of drainage areas collection and so on uh that i've been working with you know duffy willie's been out there they were the contractor on site so i've been working with them to get all that into compliance um and, and from a compliance standpoint the only thing still hanging out there is that gravel parking area from the old building. Yeah. Um, but they need the parking, and so it made sense to move forward with this piece of it. Well, that's just interesting information for us. We see more and more of these underground subterranean kind of systems for retention. Um, and, I, and I'm sure that uh, DPW is also kind of looking at them in a different way as we move on. So. Um, this also, this property abuts, I'm asking some of these questions because when you open up a site plan for an amendment, it kind of opens up that whole package, so to speak, again. This abuts to the uh, bike path in the rear of the property? Yes. Is there a public access to that bike path that you're uh, aware of? There's public <coughs> access uh, off the Doggins property. I believe that's a public access. Uh -huh. But the church hasn't made something itself no there's there's not i mean it there's a sidewalk that runs right adjacent to the the parking lot mm -hmm. uh i think there's a small grass strip right there um was connected to the church. what's that i thought that was connected to the church i didn't realize that was gone uh it's on the goggins property yeah so okay. I, you may i don't know george were you on the board when this was reviewed on the church? i don't think right. so so there there was a lot of discussion when the original permit was um the board pushed to um, have uh, the church connect and the church didn't want to connect. Um, um, Goggins um, uh, offered to make the connection on their property and connect to the church site. I see. And then once they came on to Goggins property, the Goggins property connects to the church site. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> 
Or you can have access to the church. Any other questions for the board? board? Okay, and no other comments? Motion to close public hearing? So moved. Second. <clears throat> Discuss? <clears throat> all right, all in favor? Uh, any opposed? Motion approved. Well, then we don't have any too many conditions at this point that we've discussed. You talked about the timing for the lights yep. to come off. I don't know if you want to, um, but not specifically. So that was the only other one that um, we all might consider um, for the site lights. Yep. There are four houses right along that northern boundary where the proposed light is going to be. So certainly the residents there be impacted by night lighting and just generally that area of town produces a lot of light so it's a great idea to limit those to somewhat um traditionally churches services and i can't speak i'm not a parishioner of this church but you know 10 o'clock seems to be a reasonable time to me so why don't we say 11. why don't we say nine <laughs> not, so no one will have to run out of church. Well, I don't think so. Ten o'clock, I think, is being liberal. Yeah. I think it, most. It okay. We're talking about automatic timers. If they're having an event, they can keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have to if they're having an event. Right? We're talking no. about if there's nobody there, they automatically turn on, right? Well, I don't know. No, there's, there's no. a riot. Okay. Fire? Yeah, yeah, what fire about the wedding? Event? They're having an event that goes to midnight. You have to have lights. Yeah, yeah. 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 We're talking about random time. There's nothing happening. What is it? They have to change. It's not our. I mean, <laughs> well, we have. We want to do something so that the fault is they go off at a certain yeah. time. Certainly, you can override right. a time clock to make them go off at twelve. But we want our default to say, and in the order of business, they'll be able to adjust those for sure. Um, if it's. So I would propose 10 o'clock for this part. Well, unless what? <clears throat> Can't say 10 o'clock and then so they <clears throat> assume they have the right to override it. <clears throat> they do have the right. Yeah, they, they do have the right to override that it. Think, <clears throat> then we have said that. Well, I, I, I don't think, think we have in the past. Well, I mean, this is a, yeah, I mean, this is yeah. a, well, a permit where like, they don't have any purview over it anymore once the well, you know, what would happen is if they were continuously overriding it, someone's going to call the city and then we'd have a conversation with them and find out what's going on and whether or not they're in violation of their permit. I think for a one time event, probably no one's yeah. going to bat an eye. So I'm not sure that it's really necessary. I'm not sure how many events, you know, um, I think by 10 o'clock. Most weddings are into minimal. their party very off site, <laughs> not at <laughs> <in> church. <laughs> they, they have a daily midnight mass, I guess you can do it. Right. Yeah. And they, yeah. Right. Sure. Christmas Eve. Yep. Yeah. We'll, we'll spot them. We'll spot them the last <laughs> So I think we're, we're asking for a revised planting plan, um, cleaning up the construction plan in general. Yes, and I would just, I would not say an old planting plan, but just for those two trees that may be in conflict with the sewer line. Okay, all right. So that's a revised planting plan, right? Yeah, they have yeah. To, yep. Um, and a completely new site lighting plan, or again, a revised? Um, well, I, I don't know that you need a revised plan. You could say, do you want to see the as-built using which one? with these fixtures that they're showing, they're selected with 3,000 K, <coughs> exceeding any other their standards in the zoning. And then you could just have it as a uh, lighting as well. This is what you're referring to? Right. So then they would come at the end of the project and say, okay, here's what we installed, here are the light levels, and then you're meeting the zoning. And who verifies that? The building. Yep, were there other, the, uh, the, the 10 o'clock lighting set off? Anything else? <laughs> okay, there are no other questions from the board on this application? 
Oh, it's closed. No, we closed the public hearing. So a motion to either approve or uh, deny the application. Okay. <clears throat> Make a motion that we <clears throat> approve the application for 31B190201 for site plan approval with the site plan uh, amendment. amendment to mm -hmm. oh, site right. plan. Okay. Um, with the Conditions that have been listed. Second. Second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Yeah. Oh, we're unanimous tonight. Okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now I'd like to open up a uh, meeting scheduled for 7:45. apologize for the delay by the Selco partnership Verizon wireless a site plan telecommunications equipment on existing pole at the county fairgrounds 54 fair street map ID 25c251 and the applicant has a presentation for us hi nice to see you, nice to see you too. <laughs> I'm Helen Fryman. I represent Verizon Wireless. I'm with Shaq Schwartz and Fenton, 1441 Main Street in Springfield. And um, I'll give an overview. And then um, if you have any questions specifically about the site plan, we have Jesse Marino from uh, Potera here. And then we have a um, video frequency engineer from Verizon Wireless that will talk about the coverage that will be provided by this antenna. So, um, Verizon Wireless has um, determined that there is insufficient service at the fairgrounds um, when they have events there. And so um, they can remedy that situation pretty easily by just putting an account on a, one of the utility poles that they have. Um, they do, but um, so they identified a pole, but it isn't going to be sufficient height uh, as it is now. So they're actually going to take it down to a uh, 29.3 foot pole utility wooden utility pole that has a light on it and has a speaker on it right now they're going to take that down put up a new pole um, close to where that one is and um, another wooden pole is going to be 41 feet they're going to put back the light and the speaker in the same location where it is now but then they'll put their antenna on top so um and then the antenna will, um you know service the the breadth of the of the uh, fairgrounds and um, and then improve service generally in, in uh, North Hampton. So pretty straightforward, pretty easy, pretty um, simple solution. And um, everybody's looking for service these days, so um, and various reasons. So that's the overview. Uh, but if you have any questions specifically regarding the site plan, do you have that to put off or um, no? But they have the um, we have one on a we have one on a board we can yeah that would be helpful sure. okay if you want to so our uh if we get through a motion tonight the way it's worded here it says that telecommunications equipment on a existing pole it's really on a new pole yeah. Taller pole. Taller. Stronger. <laughs> Better. <laughs> Where's the best spot for the AC you think, Joe? Maybe on the desk, even? Just
This is uh, for a 4G network. Verizon's not pushing 5G networks these days. Not yet. It's coming. <laughs> Don't get ahead yeah. of us too much. So our, our, our packet presented us with a lot of views of the pole, the installation, the location. Yeah, I can go over what we submitted. Um, we uh, submitted information on the um, on the visuals, on um, the coverage, on um, the um, the power density, um, and uh, the antennas, but the antennas. Uh, yeah, and the and the, and the, and the typical package that we submit. So, and the visuals, but uh, yeah, if there's. If, it shows where we took the photos from and then we did photo simulation so we can superimpose the tower of what or not the tower the pole um and so it's that anybody want to see these and then it shows where you could still be able to see it from but it's <coughs> it, it's yep. not going to be different from what you really want to see now so. these are impressive carolyn i think we said every applicant for these looking for out, at a site from north south east and west in color they're they're very helpful um, any questions for the applicant before we turn to the yeah. public? Is there anything you want to point out on the plan? <clears throat> no, just um, I guess as far as the location, um, you know, obviously we're three county fairgrounds here. This is what they call barn three. This is the old horse track here. This is the outdoor riding arena. So that existing pole was here, um, and, and we're replacing it. You know, within a few feet of that existing. <laughs> There is an existing underground um, surplus utility here. And there's also power right there, so we're going to try to utilize that. Uh, we do have to bring in fiber from this pole. Um, we're proposing to bring it underground uh, to the pole. Um, that's really it. As far as um, you know, we're pretty centrally located in here. I think you know we're over 350 feet from the closest. Uh, property line here and about 800 feet off of off of Bridge Street. So uh, pretty central in here and um, sort of right down in the, in the flat area between all the barns and the grandstand. It is small cell equipment, so it's pretty, um, it's not your typical cell tower equipment. Um, there's kind of an Omni Metro cell antenna, they call it, pretty small. Um, the exist, you know, an elevation of the existing poles here, and our, our replacement is here. Um, basically, there's a, a meter, a disconnect, small radio, <coughs> and then the antenna equipment towards the top of the pole. Nowhere near the size of the pole we saw up at the golf course. No, I mean, these, I mean, our rep is here, but these are, you know, for smaller areas, you know, 500,000 <coughs> feet, very kind of tight location for where, you, where the objective of the coverage is. So I know the fairground is in the uh, floodplain <coughs> here in the meadows. Is there any of this disturbance, the trenching or the erection of the pole that? Well, since it's a replacement pole, the pole's already there. So it's just taking one out and putting one back in. Um, it, there shouldn't be an issue there. And DPW didn't have any um, comments. And it's, we're not proposing to change any grades or anything. Uh, any, um, you know, we're not adding any impervious. You know, it's as a classic site plan. We don't really have traffic. We don't. It's not a, a manned facility. Very limited maintenance. It's, uh, um, you know, most of the maintenance kind of things they do from the switch, which is off site. <clears throat> so you don't really. It's not. It's not even really. Uh, um, people don't really go to it even as even as little as a normal cell tower. So. Um, that has those kind of advantages. Questions for the applicant? Okay. Well, why don't at this point we we'll open it up to the floor? Is there anyone who would like to speak in favor and opposition to the application? Quite proud tonight. We're all waiting for something <laughs> else. That's good. Hope you go. Um, we have an ordinance in uh, in our zoning around cell towers, Carolyn, that once one is erected, and I may be wrong, that other carriers can avail themselves of that tower, or? So, um, <coughs> the, 
It's not a requirement. So when there's a new poll, so there's there's a threshold. If there's an existing poll, um, and and for the purposes of this, we look at this as an existing facility that they're adding to. It just happens that they have to replace it in order to be stable enough and meet you know the weight requirements. But the if you're creating a new monopole. Um, the board can ask for co-location. So these are, again, sort of the old Wilson Road style, you know, um, 130 foot tall, 90 to 130 foot tall poles. Um, so that's, um, a, uh, that's definitely for um, new construction. Um, the board can ask for a requirement for co-location. This is existing at site plan. Um, I think that, um, I mean, you can ask if it can accommodate a, a second one, but this is, this is much smaller mm -hmm. than those typical ones where you, you know. Because it's, but it's, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not an existing um, telecommunications tower. It's just got speakers and floodlights for the fairgrounds. There's not equipment on here now from Verizon. No. no. Right, but so. what we call, so <clears throat> anything can be, you know, existing in ter um, from, um, church steeples or water towers right. or anything of that sort I if there's an existing structure, structure onto which a facility is going then it's trigger site plan versus a special permit for brand new something that's never been in the ground in that location before so um you've approved a lot of uh, not a lot several along the elm street corridor that are in different locations mm -hmm. on existing buildings for example those all triggered site plan so we review this as being there was an existing pole there. They're not planting something brand new that's never been in the ground there. So that's why it's site plan versus special plan. Okay. All right. Any other questions for the board? Pretty straightforward. Um, I don't think we need any more information for the applicant or the public. Can I hear a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Okay. Any discussion? <clears throat> All right. So a motion for this. It's not listed here, but this is a site plan then, or just site plan? Yes. Yeah. So it should be site plan approval. It's a site plan approval. Move for site plan uh, approval. <coughs> um, Twenty-five C two fifty-one for county fairgrounds. Uh, Twenty-five C two fifty-one for county fairgrounds. Horizon Pole. Second. Second. Any discussion? All right, and I, I assume the fairgrounds is leasing this. They may be making some money for it, uh, which is a benefit. I don't know for sure that I didn't hear from anybody at the fairgrounds, but I would hope so. Uh, we want to keep them going. My name's Jake Price. I have another general I'm sorry, Jake. We closed oh, okay. the public hearing. Oh, I wish you would come up That's earlier. Okay. Yeah, we're okay. <laughs> the fairgrounds is fine. Okay. Good. <laughs> Good. All right. So there's a motion to be made. Um, anyone, uh, all those in favor of the motion, maybe second. Anyone opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you very much. Jake, Great. we'll get you next time. up here and we'd like to open up an eight o'clock public hearing now uh, by Devin Howe of a site plan amendment for St. Carpa Northampton to relocate underground utilities to overhead <coughs> at Park Hill Road Florence not by D 4912. I think most of us were here when we first maybe not 
when we first approved this um, large permit for the large solar array, um, some of us were here at that point. In time. So this is an amendment. Um, could I have a presentation? Uh, good evening, Chair and members of the board. Uh, my name is Devin Howell, representing Sincarpa uh, Northampton LLC. Uh, here with me tonight is uh, Graham Dostowski from uh, Sincarpa, as well as uh, Mahi Bathula from CS Energy, the uh, construction managers for the project. Um, as the chair uh, stated, we're requesting an amendment to the site plan that was uh, previously issued by this board. Um, and really this, since this project was approved, uh, a, a few things have happened. Um, first is uh, while we were uh, submitting for a building permit, um, we really wanted to preserve uh, more trees along Park Hill Road. So what we did is instead of uh, constructing swales along uh, the entire edge of Park Hill Road, uh, we designed a uh, 12 foot wide field engineered road. And what that allowed us to do is, is really meander that road slightly such that we wouldn't have to cut um, all the trees. I believe the initial count was around 160 trees or so. Um, and we reduced that number to about 60. Um, so what we're requesting is to install three new utility poles along Park Hill Road, as well as uh, additional equipment required by National Grid for the interconnection. Um, the alternative uh, was to install underground conduits. Uh, we were originally showing the location of that conduit along the center of Park Hill Road. Uh, National Grid was going to require um, that, that th those conduits be installed along the edge of the roadway. And what that would uh, cause is a substantial amount of trees um, to be cut and removed along Park Hill Road, along what was originally approved. So we feel that it's a much better design and as National Grid's requiring uh, above ground uh, overhead wires um, that it'd be more beneficial to save a, a substantial amount of trees as well. Um, so to give the board an overview of where we're proposing these poles. Um, so to the left of this image, uh, about where we're standing on the left hand side of the roadway is uh, the first pole location. Um, I believe National Grid's uh, going to be working with the uh, tree warden to determine uh, how many trees do need to be cut uh, for the overhead wires, as well as additional pruning that may be required. Um, but this, so the first pole would be located to the left, and the second pole would be <coughs> right as that road starts to turn and head uphill, it'd be located on the right side of the road. So this second image is right as that road started to curve back up. And on the right hand side of this image is about where that utility pole, the second utility pole would be installed. And that's after uh, the Hannum Brook crossing. And one thing I did for, uh, uh, not mention is that if we were to go underground um, with the electrical conduits, then the DPW department was going to require um, to replace the culvert crossing, and it would be work within the buffer zones, and we want to minimize any potential impact to the wetland resource areas um, that could happen uh, if we were to go underground with those electrical conduits. Uh, so this third image is looking uh, westerly uh, down Park Hill Road. Uh, we're standing right at about the site entrance. Um, these photos were taken actually this past Tuesday um, so they're, they're very current. Uh, about where that tree is, is the final and third location of the utility pole. Um, I believe that tree would have to be cut uh, as part of what we're proposing. So, so you're saying that you're, you save trees by going above because you just have to cut a couple of trees, but if you go below, I guess the roots, like I don't understand why there's less trees cut down if you go 
uh, because national grid would require that those conduits be a few feet off the edge of the roadway. And there's, there's a substantial amount of trees along that edge of the roadway. Um, but so wouldn't you have to cut a bunch of those trees for the, for the line? <clears throat> There'll be a, a lot less trees that would need to be cut if we were to use uh, electrical poles with overhead wires, as opposed to if they were installed under them. Looks like in the plan, the, the line itself usually is above the road, not off to the side, because the alternating sides, the poles aren't alternating sides. <coughs> I mean, it's not, this isn't, this is going, I mean, in terms of this, it, this won't negatively affect the, the aesthetic because it's going to be the neighborhood. Yeah. No, it, it, it just makes the situation during a storm a little bit more right. impactful that trees come out of the wires or something like that underground. Yeah. You know, <coughs> And it's also a cost savings for the applicant, I would assume, to do this rather than continue in. Anything else? Uh, I just if I can answer any question. <clears throat> once you hit the uh, the entrance to the project, yes. the last pole, it'll go underground from there to your Yes, it'll go underground um, to two uh, uh, pads with uh, the uh, relative equipment. Uh, the first pad's got a mounted switch gear and utility service meter, um, and then the second pad has the utility best meter and utility PV meter on it. Um, and just to add to that, we originally had on our uh, approved plans three utility poles that were to be installed right at the entrance, and those three poles are now those two pads. Okay, great. Carolyn, is there anything we should know from BPW's comments? Or are they? Um, so, um, BPW certainly uh, ha actually um, uh, prefers the location above ground. They had a previous um, uh, written condition in terms of work in the roadway that if they were to, to do underground, that the culvert would have to be replaced. Um, uh, they don't really have any concerns about um, uh, um, and then that basically if the board didn't approve the overhead utilities that this their condition would stand to replace the pole <coughs> across Hannibrook. <coughs> and they did have a question about the decommissioning bond although it should be less than, um, but they've already posted it, um, but it was for um, decommissioning the underground conduit as well. So um, I don't know if there's a need to amend the bond or the next time it renews to, to do that. I'm not sure that's, um, I'm sure it would still cover the above ground. So that was the only other comment. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Howe before we all right. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, another comment from the DPW was just that they were asking for stamp plans. I do have three stamps, uh, exhibit plans with them. Okay, yeah, just, I'll, right? agree with that. I'll take those. Yeah. Um, there was one other issue um, with a uh, plan. There, there's a requirement in the zoning for um, screening along the property boundaries of, uh, of the property owners. I think the previous plan was approved. There was a tree line that was shown that was going to remain, and so there wasn't any particular um, <coughs> arduous review of that property boundary. But when we put the trees down for the PV array, um, it was clear that that um, remaining stand of trees did not qualify to meet the standard for screening. So they're still obligated to meet that screening on that side. I don't, I haven't seen plans yet for that, but I just want to put that out there that that's um, an outstanding issue. Right. And were you aware of that? Oh, if I can actually address that. This is, um, my directions are pretty bad. This is up the slope to the abutters to the- On the east. On the east yeah. side. The Florence Road side versus Glendale Road. Right. <laughs> and Mr. Chair, can I just, should I pass out some landscaping plans to the board? Sure. 
This is a new current application. They did not submit. No, because they were focused on uh, on the polls. However, it is an amendment and it's an issue that would have arose since the last time. So something that would be approved at administrative level? Yes, it could be approved at administrative level. I just wanted to highlight yeah, it. Yeah, no, I, I think it's anytime something like this comes up, I think it teaches me about things we should have noticed during the hearing or perhaps talked about. And now I have it, another opportunity to look at it. I did bring out pretty full size. Right. Thank you. Uh, so if we look at just the plan on the screen, uh, the property in question is uh, Mary Carroll's uh, property. She's actually here tonight. And what I've done on this plan is I've highlighted her house in red. Um, and there's really, uh, so we had to cut that stand of trees in the southeastern corner of that site. Um, and once we cleared that up, it, it opened up more of the site that was previously, I think there was like a hundred feet of uh, mature trees um, that we're replacing on the northern uh, portion of the site. Excuse me, of the site. Um, so what we're proposing to do on the landscaping plan is to install 28 arborvitaes um, to provide screening to uh, the property. Uh, this is an image uh, of uh, her property. It's, I guess, relatively hard to see on the uh, computer. Um, this one does a little bit more justice. Um, but this is looking right at where we're proposing that screening. On the left hand side of the sc uh, screen, there's uh, some uh, existing pine trees. That really is the edge of where we're proposing where we would start um, our screening and would extend approximately 135 feet to the right. Um, and that would provide a screening in accordance with the uh, zoning were you able to have this discussion with your butter oh uh, right we, here so we've um <coughs> personally been out on the site with her a few um like once um it was a couple weeks ago and we've been uh working to produce this plan thank you so in a minute we'll hear from the public and you'll have an opportunity to talk to this plan um any other questions before we open it to the public? Okay, well, thank you very much for this additional information. So at this time, we'll open it up to the public for any comments about the application for the amendment. Sure. <coughs> Mary Carol Skinner, 809 Park Hill Road. My understanding of the project certainly changed as it happened. You know, so in hindsight, as I said to all of these gentlemen, it was surprising to me they could clear cut as much as they did to the, the property. We spoke to multiple employees of the project and it was given many different answers on where the cut lines were going to be. It ended up the barbed wire fence was 30 from 33 feet, everything was cut. So on that corner of the property, this doesn't do it justice because it's so dark after every tree in the field was cut and then every tree on that corner was cut and then every tree on the other side was cut the wind shear one is amazing that blows out of that field now when we had those 50 mile an hour winds the other day even more stuff came down but i did ask and they have um presented i can't quite tell because i don't have what you have to move the plantings because all the original plantings none of them were proposed in front of me they were all, I own all the land in front of the neighbor's house. So I am your only residential abutter on the, that side, the east side, I guess you call it, of Park Hill Road. So now all I look at is construction trucks. That's it, that's all I see, except for one little part of the property where there's maybe 10 or 12 foot little, you know, green saplings. So, I'm going to change the fact that you already approved it. 
So I want as many trees as possible planted so I don't have to see this project. And I want them to be big. And then on the other side, whichever direction you call that, I want, you know, it's slow, so it's a lot harder to give me some buffer, visual buffers. So that's what I've asked for. I went to the town meetings. I didn't come to these town meetings. I went to all the meetings in the fields. I traveled for work, so I couldn't be at every meeting. So here I am in hindsight, staring at all this stuff. You know, it's my front yard. I walk my dog. I stare at it. I listen to it. I get blown away by it. So I want you to plan as probably more than you already even proposed today and more on that side. Um, so that's what I'm asking for, as many trees as possible and as big as possible. I'll take some arborvitaes, but they're not native. They took down 300-year-old oak trees. They took down birch. They took down poplar. They took down, you know, they didn't take down arborvitaes. <laughs> so I, I would like to kind of see that plan and kind of have a visual like when I go out in my yard, I want someone to say, they're gonna start here and they're gonna end here. And I want that to be real information. I don't want someone else to tell me, well, I never said that. I didn't say that. The 130 feet, is that, is that what we said? 100, extending it 130 feet? So, if I can add. So, um, I think what was said is there's uh, some existing low growing uh, pine trees that that's kind of the middle as I'm describing ex yeah, exactly. the left corner exactly the middle and over yeah there. so right, right in the middle is those those low growing pine trees um can I see the paper version sure, of the yeah I think just to clarify the bottom line is you know the zoning says there has to be a continuous screen of six feet tall evergreen so it's not going to be deciduous trees is this is the screening standard six feet upon planting five feet of width so if this Put doesn't screen. suffice along the property line when they plant it they'll have to add more so we typically do an inspection after the project is done to make sure everything's been completed and then um, would also address that so even if they added symbols to the plan and it weren't and it wasn't enough they, they would have to make sure that they're meeting and what we, we would like to be able to do as well is um, really the trees that are located within the 200 foot um, outer riparian zone, those cannot be moved uh, due to the order of conditions. There are, however, um, 20 trees that are located outside of that uh, Conservation Commission jurisdiction. What That's we, on the other end of the property. No, it's on the, so if we're looking at, um, oh, it, it's on the north side. So we talked about the bottom side, the, the, the middle, and then the top. Mm -hmm. So on the top side, there's um, 20 trees um, that are located outside of the Conservation Commission jurisdiction. And what we would like to be able to do um, also is change the species of those trees. Um, I, I believe uh, most of them are like oaks. So we'd like to use more of an uh, evergreen tree, um, switch those out. Um, so switch whatever. out a tree. So just switch out a tree. They haven't been uh, ordered yet. They haven't been planted. Yet. They haven't been planted. But I'm, I'm sorry. Are these so trees? not existing trees. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so so these trees have not been planted. Okay. Thank you. So what we would like to be able to do is just switch out the species of trees. Still meet the significant tree ordinance. Um, but have more of an evergreen tree that could provide a better screen than an oak tree, for example, which is what we have on our approved trees. But those do not address the abutters' concern because they're over here on this other portion of the plot, the trees you're talking about switching out. Or are you talking about these along the so, side? So these trees along the oh, side, okay. these, are, these are like oak trees in, in you know, yep. the, obviously the leaves fall um, during the winter you know the winter time so we, what we would like to be able to do also is switch some of those trees to an evergreen tree um, that we could work excuse me with the abutter and locate them in such a way that it would provide a better screen so if you're a recent that this is a separate amendment to address all these issues this is not part of today's hearing we're talking about this now right right this and is a, a whole separate process well it's not 
so um, they actually don't need an amendment to switch trees necessarily because the requirement is to have an evergreen screen on the boundary. So you did look at this plan previously and approve those trees, but they could evergreen trees also meet the standard. Right. So no, it's not necessarily it's not part of your vote tonight. Is really about the poles. No matter what happens um, with your vote tonight, they still need to plant those screening those screen trees on that side because that um, otherwise they would be in violation. Right. Is that required? It's not in that original plan. Not down here. No. Uh, that's the only right, right, right. So so on the approved right. plan, there was there was right. That was the adjustment when you saw in the field how open it was. Yeah, so once you know we opened up the field, Mary Carroll spoke to us and we discussed um, adding some planting there. Um, Number one, I'm not sure why we're spending so much time talking about it. It's not part of the application and they have to comply with it anyway. But number two, a question do Arbor D days count as? Satisfactory evergreen plantings. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they're so unsatisfactory. They're very limited <laughs> in how how high they get, and they certainly don't look like natural trees. They can grow twenty feet tall. Yeah. Twenty years. Yeah, they grow, they're uh, fast growing. I mean, actually, the benefit of them is they grow wide feet. and tall very quickly, okay. and you yeah. can get them. You know, I've paid, well, I right. 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 Can I just take a few more minutes and just ask if you, if you look at the plan, my point is they've done a lot to protect the brook and the town asked for more land to protect more of the brook and that was all approved. You asked for it, you got it, you gave it. My question is, look at all these trees next to the brook. No one lives there. What, what is that? Why are they not in front of my house? My property, your residential property. I'm a taxpayer. Why aren't those trees in front of my house? Well, that brook is contaminated. You're trying to save it, but why are you planting all? Look at all those trees. Look at all those trees in front of the brook. None of them in front of the property. <clears throat> we understand that, Mary. Yep. All right, that's it. But you get my point. Yep. Point taken. Can I speak? Yeah, hold on just one second. Let's make sure before we open up to more public comments, folks understand our diagram? Mm -hmm. Yep. I believe, you know, one of the reasons why a lot of those trees, those replacement trees, all the trees they cleared here, was because they are where they are there. They're not going to impact the solar array from that eastern side of the sunlight. They're also required mitigation under the order of conditions from the Conservation Commission. Okay. So there's nothing that this board can do about those plantings. It's a separate jurisdictional um, mitigation requirement. Okay, doke. So yes, we have opened up the public comments. So if there's someone else who'd like to speak about the application, please come on up and just state your name for the record and your address. Farnsworth Lovenstein, 18 Dewey Court. Six foot trees do not provide her with any protection. You can buy very large evergreen trees with a lot of money so that she actually regains some protection after they cut down 100 foot feet of trees. And while they're not ever, and arborvitae take like 20 years to get 20 feet tall. They're the slowest growing evergreens around. That's my understanding. There are non evergreen trees that will grow 30 or 40 or 50 feet tall in five years that would give her much more protection while the other trees are growing. But it's awful what they did to her, and I'm very sorry. Thank you. Anyone else would like to comment? Uh, Graham Bukowski, I represent in Cockpit. Oh, no, Graham. Oh. Just to add to the gentleman's concerns, um, if the board is willing to give us a variance on the species for the screening, we'd be very willing to work with uh, Ms. Skinner to put slightly higher trees if the board's open to that. And if it doesn't have to be limited to the evergreen species. But that, I mean, it's that, not, but that's not before us tonight. Yeah. Right? I mean, I, no, I'm just. Yeah. I'm trying to take into our, sure. our, our yeah. concerns that, into consideration. Not fill the screening all winter. Yeah. All winter, you can see right through it if it's a deciduous tree. Yeah. Well, a, a, That's the point you would of the be asking for variance. The planning board can't. Well, agreed. I'm just. And, I'm just throwing it out there. There are other alternatives for the evergreen screen, mm -hmm. but you know, 
the arbor vitae does grow quickly, and if you pick the right um, species, and, um, it will, you know, it will be a tall um, screen. But that's the point of the zoning piece. So you can certainly plant in addition to that. As long as you're meeting the screening piece, you can pick whatever evergreen tree um, that um, makes sense for the site. So there's no restriction on that. It just has to be a year after that, as you said. Yeah. But and we're also dealing with the extent of the screening at this point? Well, no, it's not before you. They need to meet the zoning. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. if the it's zoning the is what it is, um, what's before you are the poles. Yeah. They can meet the zoning and then add some taller trees if they want. Right. Right. It's always it's always worth saying you go above and beyond. Right. To, in the interest of the community. Well, we we are committed to working with Mr. Mayor to appreciate to your so offer. I just wanted to yep. make the board aware of it. I yep. appreciate that. Thomas. And I'm sure you could also meet with the city arborist too, who would provide some other professional input into yeah. the. Yeah, that's not really their role, the city's arborist. Well, but, um, rather than a gentleman. <laughs> but I will just say on the issue of the just one more piece is the reason why the minimum planting size isn't taller than six feet is because the older the tree that you plant, the harder it is to survive and grow and thrive. Yep. And so the um, I don't think in any instance the um, code would, would require or would I recommend the board say taller than what's the minimum. More is not the issue. <laughs> I would just say, uh, Ms. to Ms. Carroll and any other, you know, residents. I mean, I, it's it is difficult living next to a site like this, and um, and but it, the project is is so important and the renewable energy that it represents and, and that our our city's commitment. So I just on the personal level, you know, thank you. I know it's it's. Difficult. I don't have a problem with the solar power project. It's just all of a sudden it's like all the trees are gone. Yeah, no, I'm not, but I just I don't want to say come thank you. To <laughs> that side of the road to look, you should drive down to my street and yeah. look. But you know, I appreciate the project too. I appreciate them trying to make an effort. But I think as a learning curve for the committee, I think you you just approved too much to begin with. They should not have been allowed to clear cut to the boundary. It shouldn't have happened in my view. Clear cut to the fence. Doesn't make sense to me. Any other comments? Okay, any questions from the board on the installation of the polls? The request to, um, does this need to go back to the Conservation Commission for any work on the poll installation? No, Oh, so the work is all within the existing limit of work that was originally approved by the Conservation Commission. Wow. But much of that approval was around the installation of a new culvert, and this is certainly less grievous, right? Yeah. Well, the, oh, no. They never got approval for a replacement culvert. Oh, okay. um, no. So that was one of the issues as well, is if you have to replace the culvert, that's a whole nother permitting path that not only includes the Conservation Commission, <coughs> It includes um, probably the Army Corps um, because it's a yeah. So uh, they so what they had originally approved um, drainage and grading um, and the work in the riverfront. So the footprint of that approval is um, still um, what they're working with. Yeah. And Mr. Chair, if I can also just add to that. Um, so we are within the limit of work, as well as um, the uh, Wetlands Protection Act does have some ex um, exemptions um, to the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, if you meet um, certain criteria, um, I've listed those on the plan. Um, I believe one of the requirements is you have to be, uh, the new poles have to be at least 10 feet from wetland resource areas. Um, and we've provided dimensions on the plans. Um, <coughs> there's a few additional requirements on just uh, like where the vehicles have to be for the installation of those utility poles, um, as well as um, just the, the bracing relative to those poles. But we've added those notes to the plans. Thank you. If there are no other questions by the board, I'll entertain a motion to 
close public there. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, you second it. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor of closing the public hearing? Any opposed? So moved. Uh, so in terms of the poll installation, do we have any kind of condition? There was a note about the arborist meeting with the uh, <coughs> company prior to installation. I don't know who. That's not, so the planning, that's a separate jurisdiction. Uh -huh. So all of this work is in the public right of way, which falls in the jurisdiction of DPW. Okay. So uh, for tree cutting <coughs> on private property, that's planning board, but in the public way, it's DPW. So you don't need to um, add to anything. That. that was more, more no comments to oh, okay. to the applicant. Very good, very good. Then, as I understand it, there are no conditions around this amendment at this point. Um, no. <coughs> right. Right. Okay. No further comments, questions by board members. All right. A motion to approve or deny the application for an amendment. Yeah. Can you read it off. Okay. Hey. I uh, make a motion, uh, a motion to approve a site plan amendment for Sincapa, Northampton to be relocated on the route utility shelter head post at Park Hill Road, Florence Map ID 49 12. Thank you. Second. Is there a second. Thanks. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Any opposed? No. Second. Thanks. Motion carried. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And good luck in your discussions. Thank you. I hope yes. you're able to work yeah. something out. That's a good move. <laughs> Thanks for a good, good roll. <laughs> now we're going to hear, we're going to have a discussion about a proposed zoning amendment to allow modifications to non-conforming lots when changes meet all the zoning requirements except for the existing non-conformity. I think we need to turn to our knowledgeable staff assistant for some background and a presentation on this. Sure. Let me just see if I can um, put this proposed language on the screen. We, we, did, we did discuss this briefly a while ago. Some of this came up because of the Dewey Court um, discussion with the Zoning Board of Appeals and... Uh, well, the, yeah, so the impetus for the change was related to that, but it's certainly yeah. an issue that affects... That affects many other... Yeah, yeah, structures around the city. Yeah. Actually, many lots, dozens, <laughs> and commercial homes as well. So um, the proposed... We're experimenting with some new technology, presentation technology. You could, hey, Mr. Chairman, I brought hard copies of the existing oh, bylaw and the yeah. proposed. Addresses um, all uh, sorts of pre existing non conforming uses, structures, um, and lots, and what um, can be done with things that predate current zoning. Um, and um, there are different situations um, depending on what is being proposed for change. Or extensions, so it can um, deal with the uses on a parcel. It can deal with the structure itself being changed. Uh, so there's a 
there's currently, and there are many different um, ways that things can be addressed. They can either be done, this, this section of the ordinance allows for modifications either by right, sometimes by special permit, or sometimes by what's called um, a finding by the zoning board, or in um, the most limited circumstances of variance by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So section 9.3b in particular um, um, states that um, a um, addresses conforming uses on non-conforming lots and has different um, situations in which those can be changed. So what's being proposed is, let me just go through the code. Um, so um, states, a non-conforming uh, use on a pre-existing non-conforming lot may be changed one by right to the same conforming use on a conforming structure that meets all the dimensional and density requirements of the current zoning except for lot size frontage and depth when the lot size frontage and depth requirements don't change um, or with a finding when the change or extension is to a different conforming use which requires the same or less minimum lot width frontage depth setbacks and, and um, parking that is required for the present use and the lot doesn't fully conform to the present zoning requirements for those that proposed use or with a variance or with a combination of those two things so the proposed um, language is to modify section one to say or B subsection one as a right to the same or different conforming use adding those words, in a conforming structure which meets all the dimensional and density provisions of the current zoning, except for the pre-existing non-conforming dimensional elements. Um, and then would strike the remaining portions of the code related to um, uh, the issues of if it changes um, the requirements for lot size, frontage, depth, and, and um, and eliminates the requirement for a finding from the Zoning Board of Appeals um, below that. So the reason for this change is, is very consistent with the way um, the code has been amended over time to make things um, that meet the zoning in all respects to be by right, instead of creating another permit um, hurdle for an applicant. Um, and <coughs> the um, and of course this doesn't preclude other permit reviews so if a new use in any scenario and it could be a commercial use um, downtown let's say you need a, you uh, an applicant has a second driveway they want to put in but that triggers special permit they can still fit all of that on the site plan but actually it triggers a special permit so that would go to the planning board for a special permit but not require a binding or not be prohibited outright <coughs> because of the language that's in this code. Um, so the, that's the reasoning behind allowing it by right when every other aspect of the use and the um, lot or the structure can accommodate it without creating a different or a new non-conformity. So that's it so, in a nutshell. Yep. 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 Gotcha. Callan, I don't understand. I must be totally misunderstanding this but the, grammatically the this the length the words that are have a line through them are being struck right, right? so why does it end in the middle of a sentence which well, section one yeah. as a right to the same or different conforming <coughs> use of conforming structure which meets all the dimensional and density provisions of the current zoning except for the pre-existing non-conforming dimensional elements period but it goes on that are pre-existing non-conforming such as. That the right. one I sent you should have been struck. So what's on the screen is what the most recent um, language is. Well, that's different that from struck. what, why not? Do you have those, that, that phrase okay. struck in your copies? I do, I do. Yeah. Um, so there was an earlier version that, um, oh, yeah. that's could we accept? But after, so Alan, after the city solicitor reviewed this, uh, reviewed uh -huh. that, made additional changes. So uh -huh. that may be the issue, because I don't know, 
But this is the one that I sent out last week. Yeah, yeah, it's in the middle of the yeah, second. Go ahead, I think. Okay. So, except for. Huh. So, clear. Well, you see, see what you have if it could. So, and what I have is that one. Okay. Yeah, I just yeah. got it. Do you know what? Do you maybe you didn't see review all because they're because what correct? they're showing yes. it um, might be the wrong I think the confusion is there's an underlining as okay. opposed to the line of being the struck out. out. It might be confusing. Yeah. So the strikeout starts with that R uh, that. Uh oh I think that's step like that. Yeah. See the right hand column? It may just be the way your computer was viewing it. Because it has much more than my computer. computer. Existing performing. Operator error. Uh, let's see. No. You can when you send out Word documents, like people couldn't mess the keyboard and it changes. So yeah. PDFs are a little safer because then you know what you're sending. Yeah. Dimensions, elements here. Dimension elements. Yeah, that's a good point for see, next time. And Sarah, oh, that, yeah. that's weird. It's yeah, so they do not cross yeah. that. Yeah. I, that's where you pick up someone at the airport. Are you going to see? Okay. Enough people. Yes. We just need to turn. So, and just to put this in a little context, we're in the process of zoning approving or reviewing a zoning amendment. That's why this is called a hearing. Could you explain the next steps? Sure. That? Yeah. So, um, this is an this is a um, proposed zoning amendment. So, what happens is the city council refers. The, the amendment goes to the city council and is referred out for public hearing. There are two bodies that hold the public hearing, planning board and city council subcommittee. Um, I think it's still going to be legislative matters or that um, ordinances and legislative matters. City council um, holds a public hearing. Um, both the planning board and city council subcommittee make recommendations to the full council. Then the full council is charged with making a determination about whether to adopt any ordinance. So for our purpose tonight, if we it's just a recommendation. complete this, it's just a recommendation right. or to continue it if we feel like we don't have enough information. Right, yep. And it's not been scheduled yet for legislative matters because they've just been reconstituted, so. Uh, any questions for Carolyn or on the wording before we move on to the public? Okay. We'll open the floor. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm Attorney John McGrath, the law firm of Green Mile Clifton. May I approach and give some handouts? Uh, I don't sure. Have slides, but I have paper. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Well, we'll go work somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
to change them for any other reason. Yes. If I may just interrupt. So yes. I've been on the planning board for 10 years in the 2000s, and now I've been another couple of years now. And no, we have over time zoning um, pickups have come up in a number of places. So we've we've gone back and we've proposed zoning amendments and we've approved them and not in relation to anything. So it certainly it is very timely that this has come up with Dewey Court. But let me say that this isn't something that's totally out of the ordinary for the, for the planning board to look at or for the planning officers to kind of call out. I understand the many times that a few amendments come up instead of a whole recodification. Yeah. But what this amendment will do is change a lawsuit that's existing in court right now with the city and the zoning board as the defendants. And if you pass this, we will lose. If you don't pass this, I think the city attorney will tell you and the developer's attorney will tell you that we're going to win. So that's what this does, okay? But I also think that this affects many other developers, many other properties, because you can't spot zone. You can't say, oh, let's just change the zoning and do we court. That's illegal. So to, to make the change, you have to make the change for everybody. And it's going to have a huge ramification. Um, they're only changing a few paragraphs. But what it amounts to is this. What you now have is a bylaw, excuse me, an ordinance that says, if you have an illegal lot, okay, either, which is usually either frontage problem or area problem. If you have an illegal lot, with your know, use on it, you can change that use to a new use. So long as it's not more intensive, and so long as there's a finding from the Zoning Board of Appeals that says this isn't substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. That's what your existing <coughs> bylaw has, your ordinance has, which is a good ordinance. It says don't make it more intensive and make sure that it's not abusive to the neighbors. That's what you have. What you're saying now is that a developer can come in to an illegal lot and put a new change. What the change is, there's only one, the major change is going to be, it's going to go from a residential one family. Is it an illegal lot or a previous non-conforming lot? It's a previous non-conforming lot. That doesn't lot. make it illegal. Um, no, I'll call it a previous non-conforming lot. It's a non-conforming lot that um, is, let's say it has a one family house on it. And now what they want it to be able to do without a finding from the zoning board and, and, and with the right to make it more intensive. They want to take that and put in something different. The, the common change that you're going to see is apartments or condominiums on a non-conforming lot. A lot that's lucky because of the, the guarantees under uh, your bylaws, your ordinances in the, in the zoning statutes that they can exist as a non-conforming uh, lot. Um, for example, um, what's happening in Dewey Court, just as an example, is it was a single family home. They want to put in 15 unit apartments on a non-conforming lot, all right? And that's going to happen throughout the city, not just on Dewey Court. I, I've had someone come to me since I started this lawsuit for another neighborhood with the exact same problem. And, and, and what, everyone's waiting to see what you guys are going to do. Because either you can give the Zoning Board of Appeals the authority to make decisions, is this going to be bad for the neighborhood or not? Or you can let the developers just do what they want. Right now, the zoning board would still have to say whether it's substantially more detrimental or not to the neighbors. You're taking that away. That's gone. If somebody has one little house on a lot that's terrible, that has hardly any frontage, they can come in and put in a 15, 30 unit uh, apartment building. In fact, in most of the zones, you could put in a six unit without any special permit. So somebody could have this little house next to them on an illegal lot, excuse me, not conforming lot, and come in and put six units without a special permit, just as a right. So that's what you're creating here. It's only a few words. And the other thing I want to show is that um, it's very, very, very unusual. I've given you the permanent bylaws from the towns in the local cities. Nobody, nobody, nobody does this that I could tell. Now, I, I got these today offline, okay? <laughs> So uh, hopefully they're up to date. Um, the other thing is you have plenty of time. You have 60, I've given you a copy of the statute, 48 section five, that governs how cities change their ordinances. You have 65 days after it's given to you to actually hold the hearing or finish the hearing. So you've got plenty of time. You could have Alan Seaball look at this and see if he agrees with me. 
Who else does this? Nobody does this. This statute is not a measured statute at all. You could do a statute that says, okay, if you have zero frontage, we're, you can't do anything more intense and you need a finding. Or, or you could say, if you've got real frontage, but you're only five feet short, maybe we could let you do this. There's all kinds of things you could do with the language to change your ordinance. But what you have here is nothing more than a dream statute for a developer. This doesn't do anything for any of the abutters or neighbors. And like I said, Springfield, um, Amherst, Hadley, East Hampton, nobody does this. So why? It, so you just have to understand, you recommend this. You're doing something that nobody does. And it's only good for the developers. If there's nothing in here for the abutters or the neighborhood, nothing. And you're making it a very strange aberration. Um, also, I've heard people say that, well, I uh, currently said that, you know, oh, the zero frontage on Dewey Court, that's just a technical issue. It's not a technical issue. It's a real issue. Some of these lots that are non-conforming are non-conforming for a reason. Dewey Court is the butt end of the dead end, all right? And so the butt end of the dead end, you know, if, if you say it really has zero frontage, and the city has said that, it has zero frontage, and it has zero actual frontage. It's not just a technical issue. The houses along the sides of the street, if they have, a, let's say, a 100-foot frontage, that's a real 100-foot frontage. You can, you can have a development with a driveway here or, or access here. You can do things with that kind of frontage. But when you're at the butt end of the dead end, your real frontage is only just the width of the road. Because you don't have frontage along the road. You have, front, you have what you want to call it frontage across the road. So these are really bad lots, and there's consequences to having a bad lot. But number one, it's almost impossible to go by the cityscape ordinances. You can't. You end up because you're not really along the street, so you can't intermesh with the street. You can't be pedestrian friendly. It's impossible. So what you end up doing is building a big square box with a sea of pavement in front of it. It's like big box residential construction. That's what you're stuck with, and that's what's going on. That's what's happening if you do this. Um, so there really is a problem with some of the lot. You know, maybe, like I said, maybe others, you know, that are actually on the street that have 95 foot frontage instead of 100 foot frontage, maybe you would treat those differently. This bylaw, this ordinance, doesn't treat them differently. It just gives everything to the developer that they want. And I understand, you know, people are saying we're trying to make many of these lots um, so we can get more affordable housing downtown. Well, the, all the projects that I've seen, are the ones that people have told me about, are all downtown. And they're not going to be diminished in value because they're on non-conforming lots. And they're walkable downtown. So the developers are going to make a huge amount of money on this. Because these lots are still going to go for premium, I mean, excuse me, the apartments or the um, or the um, condominiums will still go for a premium price. They don't care that they're on a non-conforming lot. If you let them build, it's gonna ruin the neighborhoods, but it, it's not gonna diminish the values of, of these apartments or condominiums. People are gonna pay premium prices for it. Um, well, I think those are the main things I wanted to say, but again, I, I don't think you have to get much into this. Um, I've spoken with Alan about this. I've spoken uh, with the uh, developer's attorney. Uh, I told him I was going to fight this. And like I said, um, if you want to do this, you're doing something extremely different from everybody. And maybe you could at least have uh, Alan Seawell see if he agrees. Or um, there are some towns, uh, of the list I gave you, there are two that do allow this. There are two that allow a property owner to come in to switch a use and to, to modify, but only if what they're building is a one or two family. There are two, two, of the, two of the municipalities that gave you do allow that. Nobody allows someone to build a 30 or a 15 unit apartment building on a non-conforming lot. Nobody does. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the materials. All right. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak about this amended ordinance? And again, we're not we're not rehashing the Dewey Street development, but we're talking about the ordinance. 
Well, I just want to mention this ordinance change. I think you just, to me, all these ordinances were carefully thought out at one time when they were all drawn up. And I don't know how long ago that was, <clears throat> but it seems like they were very well thought out and they were put in place for a reason. It just seems as though you're taking away a lot of the reasons why they were put into place in the first place. Uh, there's a lot of great neighborhoods around Northampton. And this, as Carolyn stated earlier, there's a lot of pre-existing non-conforming lots in Northampton. And really, this is giving a carte blanche to a lot of developers. And a lot of those neighborhoods, people won't realize it. They don't know about all this wording and stuff. Who would know? But they'll know when it comes to their neighborhood and something happens in their neighborhood and it'll be too late if this ordinance goes through as it states. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm Farnsworth with Love and Sorry with 19 Dewey Court, which is owned by Joe Blotnick and Jill Higgins. Joe Blotnick and Jill. I'm sorry. Your name again, I'm sorry. I should slow down. <laughs> Farnsworth, Lovenstein, two last names. So 18 Dewey Court is owned by Joe Blotnick and Jill Higgins, and they've moved, but they lived here at the time that the original ordinance was passed about creating more developments around town. And they're very clear that the public message that was given at that time was, this will enable people to add an apartment on their land, or this will enable people to build another house on their property. There was nothing about creating space for developers to create non-conforming, using non-conforming lots as, and this is not the only one. There have already been several others where people have protested this development. So either that was true back then, or that was a public disinformation campaign. Everybody got enthusiastic about it, but perhaps the original intention was otherwise. Do you know the answer Thank to that? No, no, I think it's speculation about, you know. All right, anyone else on the ordinance? Okay. It, is there some reason that the city solicitor, or has the city solicitor reviewed this and made uh, yeah. comments? Yeah. Yeah, so the city solicitor has reviewed it, and I mean, there have been many occasions where we found problems with the zoning. This section of the zoning, we, uh, the city has amended over time, not this particular subsection, but you know this dates back to the '70s. So there hasn't, and the city has never really done a wholesale, complete rewrite of the ordinance, as you know, since 2007. There have been. Um, changes even before 2007 there were changes incrementally so um, it's definitely consistent with the way the ordinance amendments happened in Northampton um, there I don't doubt that in other cities there's definitely a proclivity to only allow and support modifications when it results in a single-family home or two-family you know that's definitely a low-density model um, the city th this is not an ordinance that um, gives carte blanche to developers because there are other permit requirements that are necessary. So a site plan review for six units is very rigorous um, and um, the ordinance was set up to make sure that it's very specific about site plan reviews. Um, <coughs> a lot of communities don't have the specific requirements that the city has when you're coming for site plan review in Northampton. Um, I think uh, the other piece is there are um, legal pre-existing non-conformities that um, relate more than, than just not frontage. We also have districts in the city that don't require any frontage at all. And um, those are um, commercial districts, the Plain Village, um, Central Business District. 
Um, so there are other zoning elements that are consistent with looking at different ways of how um, lots are used and, and developed. So it's not just about trying to get at um, lots that don't have frontage or that might not have depth. Um, so, and, and it's, it's really, um, um, I think the thing about Northampton zoning is that over time, every time, as you mentioned, George, that there's that's something that's high, that's high level, that's a problem, you know, we try to address it. Um, so that's really what, what, um, what this is about. Um, and it's not about saying that legal pre-existing non-conforming lots are bad. They're just don't conform to the zoning that was created after those lots were already built. No, it, 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 as I read the proposed change, it's it still would have to conform to density, mm -hmm. current density. Yeah. 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 Current density That's requirements. Yeah. Right. Not current density. Current density requirements. Right. Right. Um, um, yeah. Okay. In the case of Dewey Court, which is not before us now, obviously, but um, whatever the dent, whatever the density requirement is for that size lot is all that they could build. Okay. Right, just like, you know, if you had a lot that conformed, you couldn't do more than what the zone right. said. Yeah. So and the then question it, isn't conforming or non-conforming. That's, that's, yeah. that's baked into the, right. into the recipe, as, yeah. as it were. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece is, you know, you couldn't, under this provision as it stands, you, you couldn't even add an accessory dwelling unit because that triggers more parking in most districts. So where on the one hand, we've tried to encourage um, uh, and allow even accessory dwelling units. And this basically would say, and in particular, the whole reason we have accessory dwelling units allowed in any, as part of any single family home was knowing that there are some lots that didn't meet the two family lot size requirement but it would allow them to do an accessory dwelling, um, but yet it triggers a requirement for one additional parking space. So um, under that, this provision, if it, as it stands, we really shouldn't have been approving all of those accessory dwelling units um, throughout the city. And have you heard of some of the things that did? Let us just have a little sure. bit more before you come back. So then part, part also of the, uh, the impact of this ordinance change is to alleviate some of the work on the part of uh, developers or applicants to go in front of the zoning board for findings. It all it makes it a little more uh, flexible. I wouldn't say it's. I mean, it's sort of a streamline. streamline. However, there's still a requirement that's actually more rigorous than a zoning board finding is the le lowest threshold, the easiest permit to get. You don't have to really show it's a much floor. at all. Where a site plan are, is much higher, much harder to meet all the standards that are very specific. Um, the planning board also deals with the, the issues related to site plan all the time and is set up to do that, whereas the zoning board isn't. Um, and the zoning board often defers, um, particularly when there are multiple permits required, defers to the planning board for those areas of expertise that, that, that they don't have. Um, so yes, it would, um, in one instance, it um, eliminates one of potentially multiple permit paths, but only in the sense that it um, is duplicative and it would overlap some of the same issues that would be discussed. Um, there are other elements within 9.3 that allow for by right, as of right, just forge on without going to the zoning board anyway. So it's not inconsistent with the way the rest of the, that subsection 9.3 is written. Thanks. I, I just want to, I want to, to say that you just show up to, I mean, you know, you want the comment that you made when Charles mentioned something, if they will, is to allow developers to, I don't, I don't see like that, to allow us to, whatever the modifications no one is not, to benefit the developers themselves. I think because the way we, we, 
mention it. Or I, I thought that was not how I see it. It's not about the developers. Right. It's about the land use and about the city as a whole. It's not right. That's just something I okay. think is not like, appropriate, I think. Yeah. I mean, and I, know, I think so. overall, <coughs> to, to sort of um, continue in that vein, um, taking a step back and sort of looking at the bigger picture, the city um, has consistently for years and years um, set, you know, set its goals based on the overall land use plan. So we have a map and we have um, plans, we've done community um, forums to develop a plan for um, what we want or how we want our community to be, where we think we should direct development, we want to be a sustainable place, we want to make sure we have housing for people across all boards, we want to make sure that we have um, connectivity between neighborhoods, and um, and then we want to make sure we look at equity and issues of, um, you know, we, we want to encourage development where it makes sense. And a piece of that is looking at the codes and making sure that we're not throwing up barriers to accomplishing that comprehensive plan. And, and um, that was one of the big elements in 2007 when we adopted the plan was not just what do we want to do and where do we want to encourage it, but what are the impediments to that? So we've done, we spent years and years of looking at what makes sense for special permit, what makes sense for site plan, um, and a lot of it is um, the permitting. You know, we want to make sure we get good projects and good development, but it also, it has to be clearly stated and understood from all perspectives about sort of what that process is. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm rapidly taking notes. My handwriting is terrible, but I'm going to try to hear some of these things. First off, uh, the city attorney, when you have him review the statute, he's not saying the wisdom of the statute. You know, um, he's not saying that. Well, oh, this is great. You can go ahead and do it. What he's, what his principal uh, job would be to say: Is it legal to write a statute like this? And indeed, it may be legal to write a statute like this, because generally towns can be very, very generous. Um, if they want to be extremely generous to the developers, they, they can. So when he says you can do this, Alan's not saying this is wise or everybody does this, and indeed nobody does this, but you know, that's all you're getting from Alan is that it's maybe legal to do this, not that there's any wisdom to do it. Um, and you talk about saying, well, if we eliminate the finding, we still have site plan. <coughs> Okay, and that's true. You know, for many of these projects, up, up to six, you would at least have site plan review. But generally, with site plan review, you can't say, no, we're not going to let you develop this project. We want Arborvitae, or we want, we want this kind of driveway, we want underground utilities. We want, but you can't normally say, no, you're going to, you know, if, if you say no, you're going to lose on an appeal in the land court. You can't just say no to site plan review. We're not going to, you can tell them how you want it to be done, essentially, with site plan review, which is very different than a finding. With a finding, um, the, the zoning board can clearly say no. They, you know, they can. I've been in cases where the zoning board has said no. But I, my law firm has lost findings. And she says that they happen all the time. They don't. They're not a given. I've, we've got a case now, I've got a case in the land court right now where my client lost the finding to do a development. And that was to take a single family house and make it bigger. On a non-conforming lot, so I mean, you when you get rid of the finding, you're getting rid of an important thing that you've had for decades and that everybody has. But if Northampton, you know, does this, I would hope the press realizes this. I would hope the citizens realize this. What they're doing, they're becoming an aberration. If that's what they want to do, people should know it. And I just hope the people understand that. That's why I don't think you should vote today. I, I mean, maybe you can vote today, but. Um, I think you should talk to the, to Alan, and maybe uh, more people will realize what's going on here. Um, when you talk about elements where well, there's little things we could allow, that's fine. Then write a statute, write an ordinance that does allow for accessory apartments, that does allow for, for parking for accessory apartments, instead of saying, no, if you want to build a 30-unit apartment building, you can do that 
as of right now. Okay, it's very different. You, you don't, you've so gone from, yes, I'm perfect, right? Anything you still need, yeah, you still need a special permit, right? But you, you couldn't even, but what I'm saying is that, you know, you're going from a, a very protective ordinance that said don't make it more intensive and you need a finding to come in here and build it. I mean, that's what you're doing, okay? And you don't have to do that. You could write the statute like you like, you don't just write the developer's version of this statute. Um, and you talk about density. Those, some of those towns are Amherst, um, uh, Holyoke, uh, Springfield. We're not talking rural communities here. So, I mean, you're differentiating yourself from some very fairly dense places for, uh, for, uh, for where there is um, a lot of development in downtown. Um, well, to be fair, I don't think all of those locations have nailed density planning. <laughs> yeah. In a way that we would want to emulate. There's some disasters around. I mean, those places. It's impossible mm -hmm. to build housing in those places. The, I mean, well, you're making great arguments for this. I mean, in my view, what, everything you're saying is outlining exactly why we should make this change. Because <laughs> you just want to let people go. Yeah. Yeah. With, yes, basically. But, but that doesn't. I mean, I think we heard, we heard it earlier. When, when they made these laws, they knew what they were doing. They were trying to say, these neighborhoods are for these people and not for these people. Yeah. And we're trying to change that. Well, the, but that's the other thing I'm getting to. What we're talking, many of these are gonna be in the downtown area. I mean, so it's not like these are gonna become affordable houses. These are gonna be some of the most expensive. Like, I believe the units that undo we court for a four bedroom, you're talking near $4,000 a month. What relevance does that have? It, well, they're trying to make it so that we have more affordable housing in the downtown area. This isn't the way to do it. No, no not that's necessarily. Not. We, we, we're, we have affordable housing in other areas of town. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of affordable housing in the center. This is just to provide more housing in the center of town where young people can do, singles can do it, people don't need cars, people can walk to the center and provides <clears> that livability. And presumably um, the person who buys that expensive unit in downtown is moving out of a unit somewhere else in town. Uh, and, and it's increasing the amount of housing in town. Well, yes, but here's the other thing. You say that when you did this a long time ago. What about 2007? In 2007, we talked about you wanted pedestrian friendly city uh, streetscape development. If you allow this, many of these lots won't be able to comply with any of those. They'll come in here for waiver, 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 waiver. And that wasn't that long ago. And there was a lot of discussion. There was a lot of public input. There was a lot of press. And that's what people wanted. And you're basically saying goodbye to that because you can't have both. No, no, I disagree. No, no, yeah. It's still the permit yeah. issues anyway. Yeah. Right. You don't work through that in the discussion of any kind of application, you know, to provide that kind of, uh, those kind of amenities that are, you know, part of the vision. Um, but, but like Dewey Court, he, the developer basically said, I can't abide by the cityscape provision and by the streetscape provision. Yeah, he agreed that, but he also did, like, voluntarily, as I recall, um, uh, built in um, to make, uh, continue to make accessible uh, uh, a, 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 a public way that, or, it, I mean, it was on private property, but there was a pedestrian path. I mean, I don't well, want to get into I don't know, the I don't know that, but, why like, he did that. Mate Smith may have wanted him to do that. I'm just saying well, that, like, that's the part of the, let's stay away from Dewey Court yeah. in general. I don't want to talk about that, but, but my point is, is that through the 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 process here we can we can deal with those things and, and keep the overall objectives i disagree that just because <clears throat> something is non-conforming in a way that uh means that we have to work through building in these goals no, uh, what, means what, that we can't do it what, what that's I'm saying the is, whole point of this if something is non-conforming what you have done in the past is the zoning board has to make a decision on that okay when you especially going from a single family house or a two-family house to a 15-unit apartment. Okay. The zoning board would have to address that to take into account, other than just build, 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 developer, developer, to take into account the neighborhood. And they would have input on that. And, and they could say, no, this isn't the right project for this neighborhood. That's what the zoning board could say. When you have site plan review, that's not really a good option. You just say, well, build it this way, build it that way. It's still gonna happen. Yep. That's the difference. Yep. Site plan review and findings don't equate to each other. It's been done for decades and decades and decades. All the other people do it. So just so you realize you're making very, very different if you vote to recommend this as it is without trying to craft a better version of this. 
you're, you're just doing something that's kind of an aberration compared to everybody. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Okay. You know, and I think Northampton prides itself sometimes in being a leader in some, not an aberration, but leading the, the region in some aspects of planning um, that may not be reflected in Holyoke or Springfield. So, or Amherst? Or Amherst, for sure. Yeah. So, whether it's an aberration or not is a little bit term. But I appreciate all of, your, Please, no, all of your, your comments. Because um, unfortunately, a, a topic like this, even though it's promoted in the uh, the public record and the press and it's announced we don't draw a lot of citizens to come and talk about a zoning amendment uh, like this. <coughs> Appreciate your time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Board. Uh, so, Mark, yes, you ready to? Okay. Um, Wait, we can can take oh, it? Oh, sure, come, please. Dan Marie Hoja. Um, so, just um, I hear a lot of talk that you guys are doing about. Um, developments and things coming in and living here and growing up here and being here all my life i really feel for the people who live here too so i just hope that you take that in consideration that it is and we're you know there's development everywhere we see it always we, we don't nobody's against development as part of this group of the dewey court neighbors everybody understands that's what our city is and that's what is great about our city is how much we change and how much we do and and grow and around here but it's also about people who live here currently and you know what some of these changes will do to them and their neighborhood and their quality of life and what you know they can play out on the street with their kids or their family and then maybe something large comes in and they can't anymore or there's a lot of changes and not that there shouldn't be changes but i think that you should really take into consideration the people who live here and why they live here maybe why they pick the house or the street that they live on because they you know of what it looks like and what it feels like to them and some of these changes that we don't even know where, you know, some of these thoughts that this could happen or things around town could really change their lives significantly. And that's, you know, so I just hope that you guys can solve that too. So. Thank you. Any other points anyone wants to raise at this time? Uh, just one thing, you're not talking about the occurred, right? The development there. Right. Just make clear, right. Right? you're not talking about that. No. So it's okay. not based on that. No, and then to the extent I mentioned, yeah, example, I just want to make sure because your... right, this right. is a legislative action. Yeah, I understand, but I just want to make clear that right, whatever think, they're filming, whatever they're doing there. Uh, yeah, I think raising the issue, you know, uh, um, sort of trying to put it in the context of what a project might look like makes sense. I think there are lots of projects you could probably think about that aren't the one that just brought <laughs> this to light. Um, I think um, again, I mean, I. I think this was stated and discussed, and I think it makes sense to um, understand um, what um, Anne Marie just said is you know, um, the board is charged with looking at um, how projects um, affect neighborhoods. So this ordinance doesn't eliminate that, um, it eliminates um, potentially one. Um, layered it, it eliminates one of the layers that might be required for review and puts it more <coughs> way, i think in the jurisdiction of a board that addresses those things about right. neighborhood impacts right. um, which actually the board has to address whether the lot currently conforms or is not conforming so if a conforming lot came forward in front of you you'd be looking at the very same issues as whether the lot had some um element that didn't comply you know you'd be looking at the lens through the same lens at both those projects so this certainly is not intended to take away that review by the board so the, and so the question would be does the non-conformance impact you know something and, and we can do it here as opposed to the, the zoning board doing it and then us doing it again right essentially right exactly and again this language is very specific to say it's not creating any new non-conformity as you said before whatever the way it was <coughs> if that's not changing you're looking at the whole picture right. and making sure that every other aspect that's changing is in compliance and so for a property owner uh, and i'd like to get away from demonizing all developers but a property owner like it's just like the draw is whether or not they own a, con a conforming lot or a non-conforming lot and in, in for the same exact same 
project on basically the same thing. Right. Well, well, they one has to go to the zoning board, one doesn't. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. I, I don't. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense right. to me. Right. That doesn't add a layer of something to, <clears throat> that that I necessarily feels productive. And I don't think that if this was to be passed in 60 days by the city council, it's going to open up this floodgate of applications for site plan review and special situations that we weren't seeing in the past because they still have to meet the applicant, the homeowner, the developer still has to meet any number of other requirements. Yeah. So. Right. So in it, um, in many of the cases, you know, the um, project would have been going to both boards and has in the past gone to both boards. Um, um and so it you know it doesn't it doesn't change the only thing it changes is just you know, directing it one path can you make a motion to close the public here yeah sure motion is made to close public here is our second okay. and just discussion you feel comfortable that we've given enough time for the citizens of Northampton who are interested in this change to come forward <laughs> Well, don't forget, there's another public hearing too. City Council will be holding okay. a public hearing. Okay. Um, so they have other chances to what's that take a bite at this apple? Well, and and it then also goes to the full City Council after that. So um, it's not. This isn't the end of the process. It's really just. We're like, not approving it. Yeah. We're just. We're just. It from we're from our, from our, our, yeah. we're oh, doing our part. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. All right. Okay. Motion to recommend. Motion to close the public hearing. Well, you know, I know, I know. So, all those in favor of closing the public hearing. We did that. No, we didn't. It was moved, it moved, it was moved and seconded, then we discussed it for a minute. Now we're voting on it. So, all right. All we all that's seconded it, which is a lot like it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's unanimous. Thank you. We unanimously seconded. <laughs> and approved without any dissenting opponents. All right. And there's there a motion? Motion to what? To recommend the proposed zoning amendment 350-9.3 B1 and 2 to allow modifications to non-conforming lots when changed meet all the zoning requirements except for the existing non-conformities. Thank you. There a second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you for your time tonight you. and your discussion. And yes, please, as Carolyn mentioned, there's other places still to um, to have your voice heard on this. You know, so I'm telling the other folks. Yeah. For the record. <laughs> All right. So for this board, our business is almost done. Unless they're done. Don't they have this? Yeah. Uh, okay. I think the only A and R actually is. Um, uh, actually relates to the um, flag lock um, that you all just approved earlier at the golf course. Um, golf course. Um, I didn't mention it during that hearing, but um, we don't have the final plans. Um, we had the draft plans, but they said they were um, they were going to make some note changes for the, about the zoning table. So um, the final, um, but that basically the A, they've submitted plans for the A and R and create those five lots. It won't, I can't sign it until the end of the appeal period for the permit, but by approving the ANR now, then I can just endure, I can sign it um, when they're ready and it doesn't have to come back to the board. So you're asking us to approve the ANR for the five lots? Yeah, that you just approved the first. But there's no paperwork or anything, but usually that's just. You saw the, it on the screen. That's just the um, <laughs> step. We do the screen work. Yes. Is there a motion? I can pull it up. Is there a motion to approve no, the ANR for the five lots? I move it. Approve the ANR for the five lots. Second. Yeah. Discussion? All in favor? Yeah. Unanimous? Yeah. Again? Very yeah. good. And then, no, every once in a while, You're we really have to have it to say, yeah. Right. Wow, it's been a while, huh? Um, the other thing is, is that at our next meeting, Carolyn, I think you said it was fairly. We don't fair. have any permits January 23rd. 
but I do want to have bring the discussion about the where we are on the form based code for the two family units. Um, and um, actually, that would be another thing that would be an issue because the two family <laughs> would also trigger the requirement for parking and all this other stuff. That was the problem with this. So, um, two family, and I should mention that in the public hearing. Um, so, I want to have um, a discussion about the draft. So, I'll email that to you. Basically, there are a couple of issues that um, we want to make sure that we want to check in with you to see how the board feels about certain uh, either including <coughs> design elements or characteristics or not. Um, and then we'll have asked the consultant to finish the draft the work so that we can move it forward. So I want to spend a good amount of time with that. Send that draft around. All right. No, I'll send it probably to January 23rd. So yeah. You'll send the draft. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. I'm not going to see it at the. No, 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 no. I'll send it before. Great. Um, and then the other. So then I was thinking the other thing is we could talk about board configuration, given that we have new members and um, we don't have a our chair and vice chair. Yeah, we need a chair. Nope. nope. So we need to have formal votes, but it probably makes sense to have more people yeah. for and that. There, there are really some good kind of committees that members of the board can join to double your your volunteer work in the city. So I think, Carolyn, if you could send us a list yep. of those things too yep. that people can yep. nominate themselves for, yep. that'd be great. Do you mean you mean some some yeah, set up. Um, um, the planning board or other, well, board? Of other city boards um, that we represent? No, we have to send a representative. Okay. Um, You're still doing CPC. Right. But that, that period could end. Someone else could do that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, there's other ones that I can't even think off the top of my head. Housing partnership, I think we used to send something. I don't know if we do any more. We don't, and that's all changed, so we can have a conversation yeah. about that because now we're staffing housing partnership internally in our uh, office now. So, so um, going, yeah. Who's uh, Who's well, we stopped. Uh, oh, who's staffing who's the staff? it? The um, yet to be hired person. Uh -huh. um, so, would a motion to adjourn be in order? Oh. Yes, I mean, so, yeah, that makes sense. I just wanted to give the point to you. Please, so yeah. 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 please come to the January 23rd meeting. Uh, okay. Sounds well, great. Well, all right. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks right. everybody. Like yeah. Yeah. Turn. So move. Oh, oh, thanks, Carolyn. Great. I vote no.